meeting, regular meeting of the Nags Head Board of um, the, uh, We'll begin with a moment of silence this morning. I'd ask you to please give a thought to especially the victims of the hurricane. For the grace of God, go we. Um, and they're having a pretty rough time down there. And now, if you'll stand as you're able and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adopt or amend the agenda? Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda agenda to include a closed session during the attorney um, portion okay. of the schedule to protect the client's uh, attorney privilege. Right. Very good. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, then that brings us to uh, recognitions, and we'll start with uh, Chief Hale. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to come before you today to recognize Master Police Officer Daniel Danny Harris for his five years of service with the town. Danny joined our agency in 2017 after spending five and a half years with the Dare County Sheriff's Department. Danny brought a great deal of knowledge, <coughs> excuse me, and prides himself in continuing his training with our agency and is always looking for opportunities to further himself. Danny is highly motivated and is always willing to help other officers along with all other town staff when asked and called upon. In his free time, Danny enjoys uh, hunting, fishing, and most importantly, spending time camping with his fiance, Stephanie, and his little girl, Danielle. Danny, thank you for your five years of service. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your service. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your service. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Chief. Good morning, Mayor, distinguished commissioners. October 9th through the 15th of 2022 brings us to our annual Fire Prevention Week. This year commemorates the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week. Fire Prevention Week was started back by the, in, by the National Fire Prote uh, Protection Association in 1922 to commemorate the Great Chicago Fire, an event that lasted from October 10th uh, through the October 8th through the 10th, 1871. Fire destroyed 17,000 buildings and structures and took around 300 lives. It cost $200 million in damage, and today that's about $4.4 billion. In 1925, President Calvin Coolidge proclaimed the first Fire Prevention Week to occur between October 4th through the 10th in 1925. Fire Prevention Week is now celebrated every year during this week on October 9th. This year's Fire Prevention Week theme is Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape. It is timely and important to date. Today's house fires burn faster and hotter than ever before. Time is essential to a good outcome. When your storm goes off, having a plan on what to do is important to get out. <coughs> Every member of the family must know and understand the plan for getting out of the house and where to meet once they are out. <coughs> The key to any good plan is to practice it. So I encourage our citizens to come up with a fire escape plan and to practice it regularly. This year, we're happy to host our Fire Prevention Week open house night at the Douglas A. Romero Fire Station 16 on Thursday, October 13th. The event starts at 5.30 p.m. and will end at 7.30 p.m. We'll have food, games, static displays, and lots of activities. We hope everyone in the community will come and join us for a night of fun and education. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I will uh, read now the proclamation declaring Fire Prevention Week, October 9 through 15. Whereas the town of Nags Head is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all of those living and visiting our town. 
and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are locations where people are at greatest risk from fire. And whereas home fires caused 2,580 civilian deaths in the United States in 2020, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 356,500 home fires. And whereas smoke alarms sent smoke well before you can, alerting you to danger in the event of fire, in which you may have as little as two minutes to escape safely. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half. And whereas residents should be sure everyone in the home understands the sounds of smoke alarms and knows how to respond. And whereas residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas residents should make sure their smoke and carbon monoxide alarms meet the needs of all their family members, including those with sensory or physical disabilities. And whereas the 2022 Fire Prevention Week theme, Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape, effectively serves to remind us that it is important to have a home fire escape plan. Now, therefore, be it resolved that October 9 through 15, 2022 is Fire Prevention Week, and I urge all the people of the town of Nags Head to plan and practice a home fire escape for prior Fire Prevention Week 2022 and to support the public safety efforts of the Nags Head Fire Department. All town residents and visitors are at the annual Nags Head Fire Rescue Open House held at the Douglas A. Ramaui Fire Station 16 on Thursday, October 13th, 2022, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., this being the fifth day of October, and a motion to adopt the proclamation would be in order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? <coughs> All right. Thank you. That brings us to uh, public comment, and before uh, we go into public comment, Mr. Lighty, I have a couple of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. John, I blew right past you. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mayor Cahoon and commissioners. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I'm John Harris, president of the Regalo Foundation. Our board members are Susie Walters, Sandra Allen, GW Meadows, uh, Bruce Weaver, and Carol Regalo Sparks. Some of them are present here today. Um, and this is Billy Vaughn, who's writing a book on the Regalos. Um, we formed the Regalo Foundation in 1992 uh, with one of the objectives being to build a museum to tell the story. Um, uh, the museum will tell the story of the invention of the Regalo wing, which led to hang gliding, paragliding, sport parachuting, delta kites, stunt kites, and kiteboarding. Um, the museum will also tell the history of these air sports. As you know, the Regalos owned a house in Southern Shores for many years and became res permanent residents of Dare County um, after retiring from NASA in 1972. Been talking to North Carolina State Parks about this project for over five years, it was derailed by COVID, uh, like so many other projects uh, in 20. 18, we worked with Jockeys Ridge State Park to select a site and architectural rendering for the museum concept. Uh, the foundation's proposal to North Carolina State Parks is if they'll give the foundation a long-term lease at no cost, then the foundation will raise the money to build the museum and operate the museum going forward. Um, it's about uh, estimated about 12,000 square feet. So small museum. Um, our, our ballpark estimate of the cost is seven million. Uh, we meet with North Carolina Parks on October 20th to begin working on the lease. Um, we are asking for your support for this project. Um, and in the future, we would like to see a resolution um, supporting, supporting the project, the concept of the museum, and the long-term lease with North Carolina State Parks. Uh, we see this museum as an inspirational. The Regala story is very inspiring as you're gonna learn in a few here. 
Um, and we see the museum as an asset of Nags Head to Jockeys Ridge State Park, to Dare County, and to the state of North Carolina. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm gonna do this fairly quickly, uh, bear with me. Uh, so Francis and Gertrude Regalo, if you didn't know, uh, invented the flexible wing in 1948. This invention was remarkable. It had no rigid structures whatsoever, no spars, no stiffeners, but it maintains its shape and flight like a, and produces lift like a conventional rigid wing. This flexible wing evolved into all kinds of flying hang gliders and paragliders, weight shift, ultralights, uh, sport aircraft, delta kites, stunt kites, modern parachutes, and most recently, kiteboard kites, just another flexible wing. Uh, and these wings have allowed millions of people all over the world to enjoy flight in its most pure form. Uh, we're not advancing. You can scroll through. Oh, it's a scroll. Got it. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Bear with me. That was fast. I can be fast, but not that fast. All right. This is going to be a little awkward. Uh, so Francis Regal was born in Sanger, California in 1912, received his graduate degree in aeronautical engineering from Stanford in 1935, and went to work at the tunnels at the NACA, which was the precursor to the NASA right up here in Hampton, Virginia. And during World War II, they were doing drag cleanup studies of all the aircraft that saw combat. And what Regalo saw was airplanes faster, more complicated, harder to fly, and way more expensive. And he thought it just wasn't fair that only millionaires and the military had access to aviation. He thought everyone should be able to fly. In fact, his, his design idea was this. He thought, wouldn't it be great if you could drive your car to the outskirts of town and unfold a wing out of the trunk and fly away? Yeah, we never quite got the flying car, but that idea of a wing that you could fold up got him thinking about it. And he and his wife did this work on their own time. Gertrude actually sewed the first one. This is the first one they got flying in 1948. She sewed that up out of abandoned kitchen curtains. Uh, and like I said, they did this at home on their own time. He actually built a small wind tunnel in the house to test these things. Um, and he knew what the possibilities were immediately of what was possible with this thing. As early as 1949, he said, imagine the thrill of carrying such a wing to the top of a mountain and gliding into the valley below. Uh, but because he was a civil servant working for the federal government, he belonged to the government. And he took it to his bosses and showed them what he had. And they said, you know, we don't see any use for this thing. You can have it, which allowed them to patent the flexible wing. And I always like to point out that Gertrude's name is on that patent first. She was instrumental in all of this. Uh, so they... And as a way to illustrate the concept, to try to give a called real aeronautical interest in the idea, they went into the kite business. These things were great kites. You could fly them. They flew as gliders, but they also flew as kites. And you could rig them with two strings for one of the first, like our modern stunt kites. Uh, but as a way to illustrate the concept, to try to get real aeronautical interest in the idea, it totally backfired because it was a toy. No one took it seriously. So for 10 years, while Regalo continued his work at the NACA with all kinds of work, he did a lot of lateral control work. Uh, and uh, over 20 patents in his life. Uh, but for 10 years, they sold these things as toy kites until finally what happened was Sputnik happened. And anybody recognize this guy? It was actually Werner von Braun. He's the famous rocket engineer. He came up from uh, the Alabama facility where he was working to Langley Field, and he happened to see Regala demonstrate one of these little gliders like he had a thousand times before. And what von Braun saw was the possibility of recovering rocket booster engines and radio control gliding them back to land. And the, just the simple fact that Von Braun showed interest in this, he actually summoned Regalo's team to Huntsville for two days of talks. Uh, this guy, Von Braun, was the face of the space race. So him giving the kite idea, the floodgates opened, and the federal government spent over $160 million in the 1960s doing flexible wing research for all kinds of stuff. This was an early test of the rocket booster recovery. Uh, this thing was called a fleet. It was a flying Jeep. Uh, it's a precursor to our modern ultralights. It's hard to appreciate. That's a full-sized aircraft engine on that. And that is a classic Regalo wing. We still teach with those on Jockey's Ridge to this day that look very much like that wing. Uh, this application was called a precision drop glider. You could tow that, carry a payload, kind of like you'd carry a boat behind your truck, increase the payload helicopter could carry. Plus you could release the line and radio control glide them down. The army loved this. They could supply troops without committing aircraft to them. Um, these are some, uh, this is one of the first of the truly controllable parachutes. The Golden Knights jumped these things in the 1960s and did live flights with them. And they really liked them a lot because they were truly maneuverable. You could pinpoint land, you could do maneuvers on the way down. Um, this little glider was called a Parasev. They called all these things paragliders. This was a paragliding research vehicle. 
Uh, and what they were doing with this was towing it uh, behind an airplane. They eventually towed it as high as 12,000 feet and glided it down. And what they were doing was training astronauts. Buzz Aldrin flew this, Neil Armstrong, Jack Swigert, Deke Slayton. The reason they were training astronauts to fly flexible wings is that the very big idea they had was to recover spacecraft with these. And Apollo programs were supposed to be recovered by a paraglide. And the idea was fairly simple. You pack this thing up like a parachute, put the guys in space, they do their mission, re enter the atmosphere, and deploy this thing. But now they got something that flies. They can control it and they can land it on land. And the astronauts loved the idea. You know, they were our best test pilots and they hated not having control coming down. Uh, this is one of the tests they did on tow, uh, towing that up behind a helicopter. Um, but we all came down under parachutes. Well, what happened was that be on the moon by the end of the decade. And they did fly it its whole sequence. It would have worked had they been able to spend more time on it. But the reason I'm telling the whole story is that pictures like this of the fleet were in popular science and popular mechanics. And people all over the world saw these Regalo wings and said, that's really simple. I could build one of those. And that's exactly where everybody comes from. Uh, some of the first guys were Australian water skiers in the early 60s. They were towing their flat kites behind their boats to get in the air. And they were getting in the air, but they weren't really flying. If the rope ever went slack, it would crash. But from a photograph of one of these, they built one out of banana plastic and conduit. And they're the guys that figured out to put a triangle underneath it and use weight shift to control them. So hang gliding as we practice it today owes a lot to the Australians. But hang gliding in the 70s, Rockies Ridge in the early 70s, that is a bamboo and plastic. Rockies Ridge figured heavily in the early history of hang gliding. And Francis was well aware of this place. He had been traveling here before he moved here to use Jockey's Ridge as a natural wind laboratory. He actually called it that. This is some experiments they did with completely flexible paragliders in, uh, I believe that's 1967 or 68, on Jockey's Ridge. Uh, and when the park uh, was being formed, or the idea of the park was first hatched, where's my cursor? There we go. Uh, this is an early shot of Jockey's hang gliding meet, uh, the first national meet in 1973. We just had our 50th annual hang gliding spectacular. It's the longest continually held hang gliding competition in the world on Jockey Ridge. And you can see how many people there were there. Uh, but back to that park idea, uh, Francis Regalo actually lobbied for there to be a wind research facility in the park because he called it a natural wind laboratory. That never panned out, but it's a great idea. Uh, modern hang gliders have evolved in sophisticated soaring aircraft. Uh, they're capable of flights measured in hours and altitudes. Uh, my personal bests are over 12 and a half thousand feet. I've gone 50 miles cross country and had a four and a half hour flight. And those numbers are small. So hang gliding has really evolved. Uh, this is another iteration. These are technically now light sport aircraft. We call them trikes, but uh, that's one of the more uh, affordable ways into personal aviation. Paragliders all come out of the same invention. Uh, paragliders are completely flexible wing like the original ones that Regalo uh, lobbied for. Uh, that's actually out on Jockey's Ridge. Delta kites, sport kites, stunt kites, traction kites, uh, modern parachutes, uh, and again, kiteboarding. And I would argue that this place on the Outer Banks, we see more iterations of flexible wings on a regular basis than any place else in the world. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of any place that's even close. So uh, the Regala Foundation, I won't read the whole slide, but basically formed in 1992 as a nonprofit uh, task to tell the story. That's my part, telling the story but also as part of a long range plans to establish a museum. Uh, and I was absolutely floored to see the artifacts that are already on hand that are being stored uh, with John. Uh, we can really tell this story and do, do it justice. And Jockey's Ridge State Park is the logical spot. So uh, years ago, and I've forgotten the year, I've gone off my notes here, but 2018, uh, the Regala Foundation hired uh, Evoke Architecture uh, to do site analysis. Uh, three sites were considered uh, and aesthetics and infrastructure, what the views would be like, flooding, uh, huge analysis. Uh, site two was kind of designated and they came up with these renderings. Uh, this would be the front of the museum. It's absolutely gorgeous. John's idea was the, uh, the big awning there in the shape of the hang glider. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> back of the museum will actually have an observation deck that will be tall enough to be just east of the visitor center, uh, close to the parking lot and the existing structures. The inside of the building would be a ramp structure. If you've ever been to the Udbar Hazi Center out at Dulles, it will be a, a little baby version of that where you can walk around. There'll be exhibits along the walls and there'll be suspended full-sized aircraft uh, throughout the museum. Uh, there'll also be a small theater, a small gift shop. Uh, and I would just like to end with uh, the contributions that the Regalos made uh, to personal aviation. I think it's the best kept secret in aviation. And it's not just hang gliding. There's this whole family of flexible wings and no one knows the story, and this is the place to tell it. He was so deeply bonded with not only the community here, but the formation of Jockey's Ridge State Park, 
and the use of Jockey's Ridge State Park as that natural wind laboratory. So thank you for your attention. Oh, I'm supposed to remind everybody that the Regala Foundation's big fundraiser is coming up October 22nd. We have the Brutog down here at the event site. If you've never seen it, it's an absolute hoot. We actually fly empty mini kegs off a two-tiered scaffold to see you can fly them the farthest. It's really great fun. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Now that does bring us to public comment. Um, and um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Lighty. And, and with the suggestion that we have several um, things to read into the record, uh, we'll wait and do that after everyone who's present has had an opportunity to speak and then just let them be dismissed and then we can read uh, whatever needs to be read. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So at this time, uh, the board welcomes members of the public to provide public comment to the board. Uh, this is not an opportunity for dialogue and the board rarely responds to public comment, but it is an opportunity for members uh, who are here to provide any sorts of concerns or matters of interest that you wish to address to the board. Um, I will point out that there are no public hearings today. And so if you are here to provide comment on any of the agenda items, including the in at Whalebone uh, matter, which is gonna be considered by the board later in the meeting, this is the time to provide those comments since we're not having a public hearing. Um, but for those who wish to provide comment, if you'll please approach the podium, start by telling us your name and where you live and then address your comments to the board. And I will also uh, be the timekeeper and I will let you know when your time is just about up. David Bragg, Nag said, I lived in New Orleans and my life, wife lived in Portsmouth and both of us seen what low income turns into, starts out nice and within a few years it becomes an eyesore. We didn't retire here to make it just another typical city. More on this when it's on the agenda, but I do plan to further research it and speak about it more. The main reason for me attending today is the 90 room hotel, which I totally oppose. First, after reviewing the parking requirements, I believe there are 94 spaces required. Six for employees, seven as I see it for handicapped spaces, where are the EV charging stations? After all, everybody up there wants to have electric energy, so I'd like to see EV spaces in there because we don't have many around Nagsad. The way I look at it, it leaves 81 spaces. I haven't seen the design of the rooms, but if you have, say, two double beds or two queen beds in each room and people come down separately, that's two at least per room. Where are these uh, overflow parking people going to be parking? Don't have an answer to that, at least as I've seen it, because I don't have, I was not totally prepared for this because I was on vacation and came back late. Uh, the parking study or the uh, the traffic study done in September. Yeah, right. Okay, let's talk about it. Do it in July. I've been to that gas station. I've sat at that corner for 10, 12 minutes before I could turn left to get back onto 158 to get home. Where's that study? People in that neighborhood are going to be sitting there for long term before they could get back or get out of their neighborhood. It's ridiculous to do a study about parking, about traffic in September. Do it in July, in August, when it's high season. Talking about runoff, I see where the runoff's going to go. To the golf course, which already gets flooded. To the back of the neighborhood, which already gets flooded to the road, which already gets flooded. It's ridiculous. I don't know who did the study, but it's wrong. I was going to uh, couple this with the low income housing that's gonna be there. Did Dominion provide a study about grid usage? As I understand it, the government wants to go to wind and solar. By the way, wind is going to kill the fishing and commercial fishing industry around here. So I vote no to that. What we also have to look at is we don't want to become California. I don't want rolling blackouts in my neighborhood. I don't want to have to live at 78 degrees in the summer and 62 degrees in the winter because our governor wants to have the Green New Deal in North Carolina. So we need to see what this, how these two projects will affect the grid. I would also wonder what's the acceptable number of people per square mile. 
when we have all these people here in the summertime, we are already overflowed in the restaurants, we have food shortages at the stores, and we have terrible traffic problems. Where's the study on people per square mile in the summer and how it's gonna affect the residents of Nags Head and the Outer Banks in general? The, for the reasons I cited above, above I believe this project should be stopped and the area in question should be used for another purpose, for the good of the citizens of Nags Head. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. My name is Michael Bryan. I live in Nags Head. I'm here today as chairman of the Board of Friends of Jockey's Ridge. Uh, what I want to do is read a letter that I wrote to, uh, we wrote to Brian Strong, Deputy Director, Planning and Natural Resources, Division of Parks Recreation, Raleigh, North Carolina, dated September 26, 2022. Dear Mr. Strong, recently a news article appeared in the Outer Banks voice about renewed efforts to develop the Regal Museum at Jockey's Ridge. The Friends of Jockey's Ridge received a number of inquiries from board members, friends, members, and concerned citizens about the potential of this development at Jockey's Ridge State Park. While the Regalo Museum will be a wonderful tribute to the Regalans, the Friends of Jockey's Ridge have concerns regarding its location. As the Friends of Jockey's Ridge, our mission is to support, enhance, and promote Jockey's Ridge State Park as a significant geological feature of the Outer Banks, North Carolina. Does this project support, enhance, and promote Jockey's Ridge? Friends of Jockey's Ridge would like to learn more about this project, the timeline, the impacts of Jockey's Ridge, and the Friends of Jockey's Ridge, how we can get more information on the current status and how the project impacts <coughs> this project. What the benefit of the museum of the park is, what is the impact to the park in terms of preservation? Is there a completed environmental impact assessment to address the building degradation, concerns of traffic, tree removal from maritime forest, impacts to wildlife, and endangered species and wind distribution intrusion. How will the sand preservation be managed? And will this project affect the movement of the sand? Will this project lead to further commercial development? Based on the article and presentation of the Arcade Commissioners, we received numerous concerns that the lease agreement is imminent with the Regal Foundation. We have received concern messages about lack of transparency, lack of public input, and positive negative environmental impacts. Is this agreement imminent? What is the process for this agreement? As a major contributor to the well-being of Jackie's Ridge State Park, we believe we should be a part of the conversation. And then I put my phone number and email. I want to thank you for your time. Sincerely, Mike O'Brien, Chairman of the Board of Friends of Jackie's Ridge. From a personal standpoint, my name is Mike O'Brien. I live at 2820 South Oaks Colony Drive, Nax In 1973, Carol was the bomb, sat in front of a bulldozer. And I believe we are happy she did. I am. She stopped development at Jackie's Ridge, and we can all agree that was a good thing. I sell lumber for a living, so I'm not against development. Carolista was not against development, and we can all agree we made a good living here because of this development. But do we want commercial development in Jackie's Ridge State Park? I do not. And I would ask and urge the Naxed Board Commissioners to consider drafting resolution against commercial development in Jockey's Ridge State Park. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Is there anybody else? Good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name is Carol Esta I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I do own property in this head. And I ask permission to add my comments into the record. I am speaking against any development at Jockey's Ridge State Park as presented today through the museum request and also speaking against development in the future. I am one of Carolista Baum's three children who ran home the summer of 1973 to report to her that there was a bulldozer taking sand off the back of the ridge. Carolista went back to the ridge, confronted the operator of the machine, and demanded that it be shut down. The bulldozer operator left, and mom removed the distributor cap 
And with that, <laughs> began the movement to preserve Jockey's Ridge from development. The entire effort was to preserve Jockey's Ridge as a natural landmark forever. This request to lease park land and build on Jockey's Ridge, which is not only a North Carolina state park, but also carries a na national natural landmark designation is 100% <coughs> against why Jockey's Ridge was preserved in the first place. Dare County commissioners passed a resolution at their September 6th meeting in support of construction in Nags Head on Jockey's Ridge State Park, but there was no notice to residents or stakeholders regarding this action. And with this second request before the town of Nags Head for a resolution in support, I ask that you consider a resolution whereby no future development happens at Jockey's Ridge other than the improvement and maintenance of the existing state facilities. Carolista and others raised money and organized the campaign Save Our Sand Dune. In addition to organizing people to preserve Jockey's Ridge, it was all in an effort to stop development on the ridge. The reason for preserving the dunes in 1973 needs to be reiterated again today. Almost 50 years later, Jockey's Ridge was preserved to be a scenic and natural landmark for the people. If we don't remember this, then history will most certainly repeat itself. And this museum request will not be the only attempt in years to come to commercialize the dune. Children collected nickels and dimes. Volunteers spent countless hours collecting signatures, selling $5 square footage certificates, working tirelessly to raise not only money for awareness to save Jockey's Ridge, but residents and stakeholders alike work to preserve this natural geological resource. Their efforts were not in vain, as the state of North Carolina General Assembly appropriated funds to create Jockey's Ridge as a state park in 1975. We have an incredible natural landmark in Jockey's Ridge, which is the most visited state park in North Carolina. And quoting from the website of the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, the primary <coughs> goal of the Division of Parks and Recreation especially the Natural Resources Program, is to ensure long-term protection of state parks as intact. This statement says it all. I'm asking you, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, to be stewards of this landmark inside your jurisdiction and to uphold the mission statement of the Friends of Jockey's Ridge to support, enhance, and promote Jockey's Ridge State Park as a significant geological feature of the Outer Banks by declining this and future requests that dilute the purpose of the ridge. To that end, commissioners, I ask that no development be considered at Jockey's Ridge. I ask that you preserve the ecological formation, the environmental integrity, the wildlife habitats, the multiple plant species, and the maritime forests surrounding Jockey's Ridge by declining this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baum. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Good morning, I'll, I'll keep this brief. My name is Basil Belges. My wife and I live on South Memorial Avenue near the intersection of Hollowell and 158. <clears throat> There's a large, empty parcel right there right now. And that's why I wanted to speak. Back in March, I read in the Outer Banks Voice that uh, Boda Cooper and Dare County had partnered to build affordable housing. And one of those locations was in Manio. They provided the address. And then and they said an undisclosed location in Nags Head. <clears throat> I've heard lots of hearsay and rumors, and there's some, some mystery about it, but I understand that vacant lot, Hollowell 158, <clears throat> excuse me, is the location for this affordable housing project. I provided my comments along with my wife to the board and mayor yesterday, so I won't go through those now, but I just want to make sure, and it wasn't on the agenda, which is why I'm speaking now. I wanted to make sure that the board and the mayor were aware of this 
and we're looking at it. And uh, I'm sure you'll be getting some other comments. I know several residents are worried about the negative effect on property value and lots of other concerns. So I would urge the board to uh, please look at this carefully before any more is undertaken. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, does anybody else wish to address the board? Yes, Mr. White. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. I'm Stan White, I live at 460 Villadinas Drive. Um, as you can imagine, I'm standing here today to support the hotel being proposed in at Wayville. Um, but a lot of you know I was born and raised here, and I have seen the demise of individual hotel rooms. And the Outer Banks used to be a place that people could come spend one or two days to find out if this is a place they wanted to come and spend a week. A lot of people cannot afford three to four, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars per week on their first experience on the Outer Bank. So I think hotels are a needed amenity for the Outer Banks, not only for Nagsea. I'm sure anybody that's been keeping up with it realizes that I own that particular piece of property. And I had planned to build a hotel there myself several years ago. Um, I have developed several things in Nags Head, and I know what the process is, and I know how long it takes. I did have Clive and Associate draw up a site plan for a hotel, uh, sat down and came up with a timeline of things that I needed to do get approval with the town of Nag said one approval I forgot to think about was from my wife she said no she said I was too old to build a hotel so, <laughs> so, so that's where that project ended at that time but I do think uh, hotels are something that are needed in Nag said I've looked at this particular project I think the building is a very attractive building meets uh, what I call the guidelines of Nag said, and I think Nag said would be extremely proud to have that facility within its banks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Is there any other comment for the board? If not, at this time we will conclude the public comment session, except for the comments that the mayor is going to read. Right. All right. Thank you. So. Uh, we have a number of um, uh, comments to read uh, into the record this morning. Uh, three of those relate to um, Jockey's Ridge. And so I'll read those uh, first in case the folks who were here, uh, the remainder of those are on a topic that's not on the agenda uh, today and not otherwise represented in the room. So uh, we'll, we'll go to those last. <clears throat> Uh, the first is a letter from uh, Bob Muller, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be with you to present my thoughts in person. I appreciate the opportunity to have this letter read into the record. You have a request for support from John Harris and the Rogawa Foundation on your agenda this morning. I hope that you have delayed action on this item until at least the public, um, at least until public comment to allow interested parties to share their views. For your own protection, I ask that you not adopt the resolution in support of the museum. It has been presented to you with sketch plans and design details. Adopting a resolution of support would immediately create an appearance of bias in support of a project that should come to the town for review, approval, and oversight. Further, even if the town wants to take a position on the museum, it is quite premature. There are many questions about building and operating the museum inside a state natural area that should be answered before the town adopts an official position about the proposed museum if such a position is deemed appropriate. Those questions include, but are not limited to, one, is the proposed use consistent with the mission of the park? Two, is the proposed use consistent with the park's designation as a na national natural landmark and the terms of its acquisition using state funds and funds from the United States Bureau of Outdoor Recreation? Will the museum be operated by the state or the Rogawa Foundation? If the latter, what precedent is there for the private use of state park land for use not essentially related to the park and where a location within the park is not essential to its operation? Is the museum a commercial concession? If so, 
it is essential that the concession be constructed in the park with the associated uh, destruction of the natural resource for the concession to operate. That is a question. Could it be operated equally well outside the park? If it could operate outside the park, then why is it necessary that it be in the park? If the museum is a commercial concession, will there be a public bid process for the construction and operation of a museum in the park? This would occur with any other public concession. If the museum is not a commercial concession, then what role does it play in the park? Is a location in the park essential for the museum to meet its mission? If the museum is built, who will own the museum structure and displays? If the museum is built, what guarantees that the foundation will be able to operate and maintain the museum and that the museum will not become a burden on the state? Will an environmental impact statement be prepared before permits are issued? What public input will be solicited before permits are issued? Will the museum be subject to town zoning and other town rules and regulations as would any other private museum constructed on private property? If not, what justifies the exemption beyond the location of the museum inside the park? Look behind you. The town seal shows Jockey's Ridge. It is essential to the identity of the town as much so as our beaches and maritime forest. Jockey's Ridge was purchased with state and federal funds, yes, but also with the pennies, nickels, and dimes of thousands of North Carolina school children. Coins co collected to preserve an amaz amazing natural resource, not to provide land for a private museum. Personally, I do not believe that a museum to Francis Rogawa, while an admirable objective, needs to be located within Jockey's Ridge State Park. Personally, I believe such a facility could be constructed on private land. I ask that you thoroughly investigate this proposal before you take any action regarding the museum. I ask that you immediately contact state parks and discuss with state parks their view of the appropriateness of the proposed development and to what extent the museum will comply with town rules and regulations. Thank you for your consideration and your service to the community. Uh, this is uh, from George Barnes. George is present today, but is not able to speak. And so I will read this statement for on his behalf. Dear Secretary Wilson, as the first superintendent of Jockey's Ridge State Park, now retired and resident of Nags Head, I, along with many other citizens of Nags Head and Dare County and business owners, are concerned to learn of a recent Dare County Commissioner's meeting on September 6, 2022. John Harris of Kitty Hawk Kites, also president of the Rogala Foundation, presented to the Dare County Commissioners that he had state support for the Rogala Museum building site at Jockey's Ridge State Park. It was through a newspaper report in the voice um, of the Outer Banks found here with the wink that this move is to construct a 12,000 square foot building. It is my understanding that the lease negotiation meeting scheduled for Friday, September 30th, 2022 was postponed to a later date. While I am not against the museum per se, I am only against anything being built within the acreage of Jockey's Ridge State Park, which is also a designated nat national natural landmark. We request to be included in all communications and or actions that directly impact the environmental integrity of Jockey's Ridge State Park. Additionally, we request that any pending meetings and specifically lease negotiations be tabled until such time that an environmental impact study can be completed and shared with affected citizens. We would also appreciate transparency of previous discussions by any North Carolina state agency, agency for or with Mr. Harris's businesses and or foundations, et cetera, as to entrance, development, leases, memoranda fees, and use of current visitor center facilities now in place at Jockey's Ridge State, Far State Park. Finally, we request the past five years revenue statements from 2017 to current for the Jockey's Ridge slash Kitty Hawk Kites lease as to verify that the 8% lease agreement has been dispersed and verified through the financial statements produced to the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources. Any and all future meetings for lease negotiations and or memoranda should not proceed or be executed outside of an environmental impact study, a traffic study, a wildlife study, and a wind study. And the third and final letter I'm sorry, that is a second copy of the, the same statement. Um, so I am not aware that I have any other um, uh, statements to read on either the hotel or 
the Jockey's Route State Park. All right. Uh, but we have a number to read on other on other topics. Um, so um, uh, Mr. Belshes uh, spoke earlier, and so I will not read his comments into the record this morning. Uh, this is from Sharon DeLora. Dear Board of Commissioners, we own a beach home at 3624 South Virginia Dare Trail, Nags Head. The property behind us and several other homeowners in this area is undeveloped. It has come to our attention that the county is working with Woda Cooper to build low-income housing on this parcel of land. We and many other property owners feel this area is not the best fit for such a development as it would adversely affect the Board of Commissioners feels the same way and denies the request for such development on this parcel of land. The proposed property is right across the street and denies uh, the request for such a development on this parcel of land. The proposed property is right across the street from a major tourist attraction, Jockey's Ridge, and has direct access to the beach. We feel that more single family homes on this property is a better use of this highly valued parcel of land and would generate more revenue for the city. Uh, this is from Chess Har Harris. Dear Mayor Cahoon, we live at 3541 South Memorial, just across Hollowell from the planned development of the vacant lot to the south into a low-income neighborhood. We live here. This is our home. We are appalled with this drastic housing devaluation initiative and pray that common sense and commitment of our next head government leadership will prevail to your taxpaying citizens and vote. Multi-family, low-income dwellings abutting on high-value single families are a recipe for property devaluation and crime to tap just a few of the looming issues. Please do not let this bad initiative gain momentum. This is from Susan Kalin. To Mayor Ben Cahoon, Mayor Pro Tem Mike Sears, and commissioners, attached is a letter, excuse me, that we would like to give your attention regarding housing units in Nags Head. It has been brought to our attention that the roughly 100 essential and workforce housing units under a partnership with Dare County and the Ohio-based firm Woda Cooper may be constructed on property at the intersection of Route 150A and East Hollowell Street. We are most concerned and disturbed about this as we are property owners of a home located directly across the street, 104 East Hollowell, from this site. In a March article, Bank's Voice website, it was reported that this project is eligible for the low income housing tax credit, which subsidizes the acquisition and construction of affordable housing for low to moderate income households. It was slated for sites on Roanoke Island as well as a not yet disclosed location in Nags Head. While we realize there is a need for affordable housing to maintain a workforce in the Outer Banks, we are opposed to its location at Route 158 and East Hollowell Street. We feel we have been kept in the dark as to what this undisclosed Nags Head location would be. First off, this location is very near the entrance of Jockey's Ridge and possibly one of the most major attractions on the Outer Banks. Make a right turn on Carolista from Route 158 South and you enter this national landmark. Make a left turn on East Hollowell Street from Route 158 South and you enter Old Nags Head Place in a neighborhood that is comprised of full-time residents and non-resident property owners who very much value and maintain a respectful quality of life that is most attractive and desirable to renters. We know because we are non-resident property owners who rent our home during June, July, and August to returning families who know that when they put their hard-earned monies down on a summer home to spend quality time with their own families, they can rest assured that they will enjoy peace and relaxation. They can enjoy the hot tub and in-ground pool, walk to the nearby beach access, which has a lifeguard, walk across to Jockey's Ridge, and even enjoy a walk around the corner to Snowbirds for some cooling desserts. East Hollowell Street is busy enough. We see the heavy traffic that crosses from the beach road to Route 158 during the summer months. We see the many golf carts and bicycles, not to mention families walking with baby carriages or leased, leased dogs that frequent the street. Even though there are stop signs at both ends of the street and South Memorial Avenue entering Hollowell Street, there have been many, many cars and trucks that do not heed these signs. Add to this more roadways entering another housing area and more traffic to what is a desirable neighborhood, and you're looking for potential accidents and crime scenes. Yes, we rent during the summer months, but we also enjoy a family week during that time, so we witness firsthand a heavy traffic load. And yes, when our rental season ends, we as homeowners love to enjoy our home the rest of the year and with family on major holidays. 
We made major improvements indoors and outdoors to our home. When we're not there, we like to think our property is safe and that our vendors can work undisturbed. We've heard that the town likes to keep outdoor lights low or not at all. As a homeowner, we like to keep a light on under the carport when we are not there. There was a time when we had a spotlight near the roof of our home directed to the ground pool area, but we were notified by the town that it looked like a helicopter could land there in the night, so we changed its direction. So imagine <coughs> the lighting that would have to go in this housing area across the street and have it shining on our facing yard and windows when we were told that we had too much light in the night. We had one incident in April of this year when a car was abandoned on our nicely kept property, and we were told by the police that we would have to wait seven days before it could be towed away. We know the stormwater project is in the works for Old Nags Head Place. That's another issue that we're facing. Just know that we as property owners are in the direct path of this housing project, and we are opposed to the location. Um, and I'm going to take a break and let uh, the town manager read some of these. <coughs> if you are interested in leaving, it will not be rude for you to, if, you're, if the issue you're concerned about has been addressed, you are welcome to leave at this time. Andy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this letter was uh, sent to us from Alan R. and Judy C. Turner. Mm -hmm. Dear Mayor, Mr. Garman and Town of Nags Head Board of Commissioners, our names are Alan R. Turner and Judy C. Turner. We own the property at 3610 South Virginia Deer Trail in Nags Head. We are writing as concerned property owners to voice our opposition to the proposed affordable multifamily housing development site at 100 East Hollowell Avenue, lot 3351 through lot 369 and part 41 in the George T. Stronach subdivision. We do not believe the Hollowell site is the appropriate choice for this project due to the historical value and unique ge geology associated with Jockey's Ridge. We also are concerned about the lack of communication and limited disclosure of information regarding the Hollowell site. To date, we have not received anything on this proposed development until our neighbors called us on October 1st, 2022. They shared with us what was going on and that the selected site was the property directly behind ours. I want the town of Nags Head to understand that my husband and I do not have this property just for rental. We rent so we can afford this property in hopes that we'll be able to retire there someday. And we have put a great deal of retirement funds into this property. While the George T. Stronach subdivision we will be lucky to get what we paid for our house before we did all the upgrades as it will great, greatly diminish property values in this area. I'm asking that you reconsider this proposal and think of the taxes and income this area brings to the town of Nags Head. I also understand that you need housing and that the town is going to receive a huge amount of money for agreeing to this proposal. I only ask that as good business people, you reconsider the area that you are planning this development. You're in the heart of your beautiful town. If not properly maintained, you will lose your number one commodity, your tourist season this summer. Best regards, Alan R. and Judy C. Turner. This letter is from Jeff and Pat Pavlak. Uh, was sent to uh, me and also the Board of Commissioners. Good morning, Andy. My wife, Pat, and I are homeowners at 3616 South Virginia Deer Trail, Nags Head. It's come to our attention that there's a high density housing project being proposed at the Hallwell Street site adjacent to our property. We want to go on record that we are opposed to this proposed project. We f please find the attached letter of opposition up to the proposed project stating our concerns. Uh, here's the letter uh, to Andy Garman, Town of Nags Head Town Manager and members of the Board of Commissioners. We are sending this letter to strongly oppose the HUD housing project referred to as the Nags Head site along US 158 between Hollowell and Conk Streets as it is now proposed. We strongly recommend to rezone this 4.7 acre parcel from high density population to low density population as the original intended use for 16 individual family homes. This is consistent with the town of Nags Head land use plan dated June 2017. We recently found out about this project that would be adjacent to our property when we saw a surveyor on our property taking measurements in early September. As we have investigated further, we now know this is a proposed HUD housing project to include three brick, three-story buildings totaling 54 units that would be comprised of 10 one-bedroom, three two-bedroom, and six three-bedroom units, and an external area for picnic tables, benches, grills, and parking for the extensive number of cars that would be needed. While we understand the need for housing and essential workers, we strongly disagree that this will help the town of Nags Head given the low income requirements to qualify for this housing. 
There's a disconnect between what salaries of essential workers and NAGS had received versus the maximum income requirement of this housing. Additionally, as homeowners, we have concerns that we would like to be addressed at future board meetings. What will the impact of stormwater runoff and sewage treatment be? How is the proposed plan consistent with the current character and vision of the NAGS head land use plan goals I3.1, which reference preserving our community's distinctive heritage and unique lifestyle by having a relaxed paced family beach community comprised of primarily low density development and open spaces? How will light and noise pollution be addressed for impact to adjacent homeowners? What will the oversight be to ensure renters are not subletting to charge higher seasonal rates? What is the oversight to ensure the property is maintained once renters qualify to live there? When we purchased our home at 3616 South Virginia Dare Trail in 2012, the primary thing that drew us was the residential historic feel of, of a family community in a low density area. We knew then that Nags Head was something special and uniquely, uniquely different from any other towns nearby due to the low density and uncrowded roads and beach. We appreciated our views of Jockey's Ridge State Park and the quiet nights spent on our back deck watching sunsets. We sa saved up for many years to purchase this home with the goal of spending many happy years of our retirement here. We do not believe this Woda Cooper project would solve the problem of affordable housing for essential workers in Nags Head and it is directly opposed to the intended use of this land as stated above. We request that this letter be read and entered to the public record concerning the housing project in Nags Head. As homeowners and taxpayers, we appreciate the opportunity to have our voice heard and look forward to having these concerns addressed. Sincerely, Jeff and Pat Pavlak, 3616 South Virginia Air Trail, Nags Head. Dear Mayor, Town Manager, and Board of Commissioners, my name is Nadine Johnson, and my husband and I own the property located at 3612 South Virginia Deer Trail in Nags Head. It's come to our attention within the past week that the property adjoining ours is being considered as a potential site for an affordable housing development. Attached, please find our letter of opposition and concerned. Please acknowledge receipt of this letter that it will be read and entered into the public record for this project. We would like for our concerns to be discussed slash considered at, the fu at future board and town meetings. Thanks for your consideration, Nadine and David Johnson. Dear Mayor, Mr. Garman and Town of Board of Town of Next Head Board of Commissioners, my name is Nadine Johnson. My husband and I run are the property owners of 3612 South Virginia Dare Trail in Nags Head. While we are writing as concerned property owners to voice our strong opposition to the proposed new affordable multifamily housing development site at 100 East Hallowell Avenue, lot 351 to 369 and part 41 in the George T. Strone Act subdivision. While we understand and appreciate the need for affordable housing at the Outer Banks, we do not believe the Hollowell site is the appropriate choice for this project. The decision to compromise, compromise the area's historical value and unique geology associated with Jockey's Ridge shouldn't be made lightly. We are concerned about the lack of communication and limited disclosure of information to date regarding the Hollowell site approved in the very short term. It seems this has been a and it's alarming to think that the plans may have been purposefully kept vague and disclosed to avoid opposition. Below is a list of our initial comments and concerns. Environmental and tourism impacts. We are very concerned about the stress that new development will create on the environment due to the modifications that will be required to support <laughs> traffic, parking, drainage, septic, waste disposal, the electrical and telecommunication grids, etc not to mention the prolonged disruption and inconvenience since the area will suffer while potential development occurs. We do not believe that this site, even with modifications, can effectively accommodate the strain. The proposed site is directly across from Jockey's Ridge, the largest living sand dune on the eastern seaboard. This historic state park is a national landmark and is already at risk and fragile. Over the years, the sand dunes have been diminishing and we are highly concerned that development and oversaturating the population in this area could potentially potentially stress the integrity of the dunes further. One of the primary reasons folks gravitate and tour Nags Head is that it has maintained its historical char character and to visit Jockey's Ridge. We are already challenged by the impacts of climate change and are concerned that the planned redevelopment of the area will further jeopardize and degrade the unique geological features of the sand dunes. In addition, we are concerned that the juxtaposition of multi-story, multi-family buildings will diminish the historical quality and value of the area. Has the town performed any of the following independent third-party third non-developer-driven studies for the specific location? 
environmental impact study, economic impact study, tourism impact analysis, view shed slash light pollution and light trespass analysis. Has the historical society been engaged in the planning for this specific site? Zoning concerns. And adjoins low density housing in a state park. We believe the Hollowell parcels should be rezoned similarly, similarly and in accordance with the town's established comprehensive plan and land use guidelines. The proposed plan to construct up to 60 plus units in three separate buildings to accommodate up to conservatively 120 renters and residents, their potential pets, their vehicles into a small, narrow and oddly shaped parcel will put a tremendous amount of stress on the area. We believe there are more accommodating sites that should be considered for this project. Typically, as new development projects are planned, careful consideration is placed to ensure proper vegetative barriers exist and that there are adequate transition spaces between the pros proposed new development and the surrounding area. The current Hollowell site is highly vegetated and serves now as home to some wildlife, deer, foxes, birds, etc., and is a barrier that absorbs highway noise, beach noise, etc. The site is very narrow and oddly shaped, pretty much co a compressed triangle with established single family homes backing up this vegetation. We are concerned that once this vegetative barrier is destroyed, there is no, no realistic way to offset the destruction and there is no realistic way to ensure proper trans transition space is provided due to the size and scale of the proposed project. Historically, our town has been strongly opposed to the development of many hotels. Many folks appreciate and relish the simplistic old school feel of a vacation and the cozy, reasonably sized cottages in Nags Head. By altering the proposed site, we will alter the demographic who appreciate the quality and character of Nags Head the most. Although we have not seen the actual drawings or plans for the proposed affordable housing project, by any other name, the units should be considered glorified mini hotels. Strong, short and long-term regulatory fraud and abuse concerns. We are highly concerned that the property will not be properly regulated, managed, and maintained in both the short and long term. We are also concerned that the planned site will be especially vulnerable to the high levels of fraud and abuse given its prime location, which will negatively impact surrounding homeowners and taxpayers indefinitely. There are plenty of available alternatives. We firmly believe that there are other available options that are better suited for this development project that should be diligently pursued and explored. Based on internet searches, there appears to be a good bit of available land that would support a development of this size and scope. Can the town please disclose what other options were considered for this program? Thank you again for your consideration of our concerns. Please, cons please confirm receipt and acknowledge that our letter will be read in, in its entirety and entered into public record for this project. Thank you, Nadine and David Johnson. Can we do a few more? I have a few more. Uh, this is from Kimberly Worley. Uh, dear Mayor and Commissioners, I understand that a vacant property that borders Hollowell and Route 158 is being considered as part of the Dare County Woda Cooper project for affordable housing. And as a homeowner of 3523 South Memorial Avenue, I'm contacting you to let you know that I object to this use and hope you will vote against it. I purchased my home in 2019 as a rental property until retirement. And while I understand the need for affordable housing, this use just doesn't seem to fit in with the feeling or charm of the neighborhood, which was my reasoning for purchasing an old nags head. My concerns are the extra traffic it will cause, the overcrowding of the beach access paths, and the value of the homes decreasing. There must be a more suitable location for this project. Please reach out if there are any questions. Brenda and Albert Metley. We have discovered that Nags Head is considering an affordable housing project immediately behind our property, 3618 hmm. South Virginia Dare Trail. Attached, please find our letter of opposition to this location. We trust that our letter will be entered into the public record and discussed at future town meetings. Mayor and Mr. Garman, Ta Town of Nags Head Board of Commissioners. It has come to our attention that the town of Nags Head intends to build an affordable housing complex immediately behind our property at 3618 South Virginia Dare Trail. We are writing this letter to express our opposition to this location. We are well aware that housing is needed for additional workers in the Outer Banks. Your location for the site across the street from Jockey's Ridge State Park is a very expensive proposition for Nags Head taxpayers. There's an abundance of land available in Dare County. Why build this in a resort area adjacent to a state park? We're also concerned that location of the site was never mentioned by the Dare County commissioners in their meeting to approve the project. They only mentioned the Nags Head site, but not a specific location. There's been zero transparency regarding this location in Nags Head. 
In researching the firm that is involved in the management of this project, Woda Cooper, I find essentially a two-star rating. Has anyone researched this company to determine its viability? This being a HUD project, how can you assure that only Dare County workers will be housed at this location? It was our assumption that NAGS had opposed many hotels and mega mansions to preserve family vacation environment. This location of the project flies in the face of that concept. Is this, did you read, these are the same comments. Did you read this earlier? I don't think I read that okay. particular letter. <laughs> we strongly recommend to rezone this parcel of land to a lower density population, as was the original intended use for individual family homes. This is consistent with the Town of Nags Head land use plan dated 2017. We request that this letter be read and entered into the public record concerning this HUD housing project. As a taxpayer, we look forward to having your concerns addressed regarding this issue. And that is the last one. I have one more. Okay. <laughs> Not so fast. Sorry. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Garman, we are property owners in Nags Head. We recently found out about the proposed HUD project for the lot behind our home. Please share our attached letter with the Board of Commissioners and the Mayor. We would like it read into public record in opposition to this project. We greatly appreciate your time and consideration. Sincerely, Kathy and Kevin DiPolito, 3614 South Virginia Deer Trail. Dear Township Manager, Mayor, and members of the Board of Commissioners, please let this letter serve as our strong opposition to the development along US 158 between Hollowell and Conk Streets at its currently, as it's currently proposed. We strongly recommend that this parcel be rezoned to low density residential in keeping with the vision focus and land use plans for Nags Head, especially the historical character area that it is located in as per the June 2017 comprehensive plan. Although we agree there is a need for affordable housing for essential workers, this project is in direct conflict with the very best interests of nearby property owners, the township's comprehensive plan, and Dare County's essential workforce housing efforts. Please find, find below some of our concerns regarding the housing project. As stated within Section 2.32A, Historic Character Development Plan of the 2017 Nags Head Comprehensive Plan, Table 2.3.2A, appropriate land uses in the historic character area, this area where this proposed project is proposed is reserved for, among other things, single family dwellings not exceeding 5,000 square feet. Large multi-residential structures are not a recommended approved listed use for this district. Additionally, it's stated throughout the NAGSA comprehensive plan that Jockey's Ridge has been designated as a unique coastal geologic formation area of environmental concern, AEC. It is a national nat or natural landmark of the U.S. interior. The NHCP states that minimal development is paramount, promote low density residential development and residential uses in a manner that protects and preserves natural topography and vegetation, and to protect the bordering lands, bordering lands from intense development to maintain scenic and environmental qualities. Again, this, proposing housing, this proposed housing plan is not in compliance with the Nags Head Comprehensive Plan. It is well known that Dare County owns lots throughout the county. Why was this particular lot chosen, especially considering it does not comply with the aforement aforementioned comprehensive plan? We strongly recommend this zoning, the zoning for this parcel be rezoned to accommodate low density residential. This would align for the vision and land use for the historical character area as detailed in the Nags Head comprehensive plan. There has been no pres presentation of a site plan or elevation images for the community to review. Without presentation of a site plan, neighboring property owners <coughs> do not have the benefit of being able to act, to do a risk benefit analysis. For, ex for example, it is well known best practice of the fire service to establish a collapse zone 1.5 times the overall height of the building on all sides. Without being afforded the opportunity to review a proposed site, neighboring property owners are un unaware of how this project may jeopardize their property. Lighting analysis has been conducted to show how exterior lighting will affect neighboring environment. As of this time, there have been no information provided regarding stormwater management for the property. What will impact on wildlife and the environment, Jockey's Ridge, schools, the healthcare system, emergency services, and traffic? One of the most dire employee shortages is the healthcare system. As of this letter, there are currently 49 job openings at the Outer Banks Hospital. Based on the hourly wage of these positions and the requirements set forth by Woda Cooper slash HUD, it is highly unlikely that people qualified for these full-time positions would be eligible for housing at this location. The same holds true for jobs that the town of Nagsend currently has open. 
the police officers make 50,000, maintenance workers make between 30 and 50,000. This is not solving the essential worker housing needs. Prior to being homeowners, we had been visitors to Nags Head for many years, camping with our family when we were younger, vacationing year after year with our growing family. We always chose Nags Head as our Outer Banks destination. We worked hard to reach our goal of purchasing a home in Nags Head with the dream of living out our retirement there. Nags Head has a charm and quality that is unique with great history, wonderful parks and beautiful uncrowded beaches, paths and roadways. The homes give the feel of a warm beach community. Please help us keep it that way. As tax paying property owners, we thank you in advance for reviewing our concerns and look forward to them being addressed at upcoming township meetings. Lastly, we request that this letter be read and entered into the public record regarding this project. Sincerely, Kathy and Kevin DiPolito, 3614 South Virginia Deer Trail. Mr. Lighty. Is that the last of the comments? I believe so. All right, we can conclude the public comment session. All right. With the indulgence of the board, I would like for us to get through in the interest of the folks who've been waiting the site plan before we take our break. Um, so that would bring us to the consent agenda. The motion would be in order. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Brings us to reports and recommendations from the planning board and the planning and development director. Good morning, Mayor, Good morning. Commissioners. Um, would you prefer that I go ahead and move forward to the Wellbone um, site plan or go ahead with the direct? Uh, your report is not okay. that long, I don't think. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go ahead and pull it up quickly. Um, we'll start off just by talking about the, uh, the last planning board meeting that was held on September 20th. And at that time, they reviewed a special use permit um, site plan review for two items. One is a trade center located on Satterfield Landing in between TWs and the Village Realty Real Estate Management Facility. Um, the other item that they reviewed was um, various public works facilities associated with the um, public works facilities master plan. Uh, staff to give an update on the um, North Carolina Parks Accessibility for Parks um, grant that we're looking to pursue as a part of. Um, at the upcoming planning board meeting, um, staff intends to give several updates at that time. We're also going to ask that the planning board consider initiating a text amendment. Um, to our flood damage prevention ordinance. It requires engineer drawings and V-zone certifications for any work um, east of NC-12, including replacing a set of stairs. Um, so that type of requirement being associated with just a, a simple stair replacement um, seems to be a little excessive at first glance. Uh, Might have been an unintended consequence of um, adopting that LES. So we want to look into that a little bit further. Um, before we move away from this, I did want to note that planning staff and the planning board have been um, discussing our existing tree preservation um, and removal regulations. Um, we had hoped to strengthen those regulations or at least clarify where there was some ambiguity um, but before we get too far down that path, I wanted to bring it up to the Board of Commissioners um, to get any feedback or direction that you may have in terms of how we move forward with that. Um, and perhaps if there's anything to discuss today, we can do that as I finish this up here quickly. Um, the decentralized wastewater management plan and the voluntary septic subscription service um, we had our second meeting on Wednesday, September 28th. It was a really great meeting. Um, we had a septic contractor, Jimmy McNeil, and his daughter, Cassidy McNeil, there with us um, to go over what this program um, would look like to a septic contractor, any um, pros and cons that he would see around that, um, and also a conversation around liability and what... Um, liability the town may assume as part of this type of septic subscription service 
So next steps is to have a conversation with our attorney, John Mighty, um, about liability in that regard. Um, we also talked a lot about increasing education and outreach for the septic health program. Um, the estuary and shoreline management plan, um, erosion, infrastructure protection, and um, scale and impact were the top variables that were indicated by the um, citizen input in the advisory committee when it came to um, prioritizing the top three sites moving forward to conceptual design. Um, at this point, we do have uh, three areas identified. The first is the Harvey Tract and the Outer Banks Visitors Bureau site. The second is the Soundside Road area um, where we have the road and that high energy erosion happening there. Um, and then lastly is the High Bank area of Nags Head Woods Road um, where the town road is located. There's some erosion in that area and all the way back to the villas. Um, so it's a very broad look at this. It obviously has to be narrowed down with much more detail, but that's where we're at at this point. Moving down, um, staff has submitted uh, the Outer Banks Visitors Bureau Tourism Impact Grant or TIG grant that went out on September 29th. Um, and that would help support construction of a restroom at Wellbone Park. Um, we're, like I said, we're also pursuing a part of grant with the AFP Accessibility for Parks grant application. Um, that's due November 1st. It's based on a point system, which is going to require that we go back through that public engagement um, that we had previously done for the part of grant. So um, that's currently planned. Um, a public meeting currently has planned for October 25th. And we'll be pushing a lot more information out about that. Um, the Dune Management Cost Share Program, uh, that period opened up on Saturday, October 1st. Um, the application information for that, all of that's accessible on our website now. Uh, Dowdy Park, we have a movie, um, The Book of Life. That's going to be shown this coming Friday at 6.30, or once it's dark enough to do so. Um, we're preparing for the holiday markets. The first one is going to be on Saturday, November 12th. And I just want to note that the Art and Culture Committee has been working on a lot of other fun ideas within the town. Uh, we're looking at a holiday decorating contest, um, as well as a flashlight candy cane hunt for kids at Downey Park, and um, the second annual tree lighting ceremony. We're looking forward to that again this year. And um, lastly, the Committee for Art and Culture is actively working on phase two of the Art Mask project. So we're uh, talking about the uh, various local artists that we would like to reach out to to um, participate in that program and get three to four more masks out on the beach road by spring. So. Kelly, can I ask a quick question? Sure. The uh, holiday markets, it says that the applications go live on the 13th of October. Yes. And the first market is November 12th. Do you know what date those applications are due? So they're first come, first serve. Um, you will go online and there's going to be four markets. You fill out your application, you indicate the market that, because not everybody will want to attend all four. Um, so like I said, it's first come, first serve. It's usually done within a couple of hours of opening on, on that day. Okay. I, I, I asked that question. Commissioner Cahoon had noticed in the last month's minutes that there was a, a mistake with a date there. So the October 13th okay. clarifies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. I'll go and check that. That's all I have um, as far as the report. Um, yes, go ahead. On the tree, since I brought up the trees, I'd like to see some special emphasis on the town's live oak <clears throat> designation. And the reason I brought it up initially was because people were butchering live oaks just for a view shed in the villas. Um, that to me was just not acceptable. They should have talked to the town because we do have special designation, not supposed to just be butchering the trees. Um, some of the things that they're considering, I had a concern about, I think Commissioner Brinkley did too, um, like the 25% uh, canopy, canopy. Mm -hmm. and the yes. 
I'm not sure the staff is prepared or the town is prepared to keep up with the tree bank per se. Much as I like the idea, I don't think they're prepared to do that. But just to try to strengthen our ordinance just a little bit to preserve vegetation, not just take it away. That's great. We'll move forward with that. Thank you. Anyone else? Just she said it for me, but I appreciate that. And what Commissioner Cahoon said about what happened in the villas is totally wrong. That's my concerns were just uh, E and H under 26.9, the tree bank, and then the 25% canopy. I think both of them would be very hard to manage. But thank you for your work on that. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> that brings us then to consideration of a site plan submitted by House Engineering for construction of a four story 90 unit hotel. We will have a changing of the guard in terms of attorneys. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. And, and before Kelly got started, I didn't know if you, the board wanted me just to briefly review what your, uh, the procedure for what you're reviewing today, what your options are. And, um, yes, okay. Please. Um, so just briefly, this is a um, site plan approval. It's not quasi-judicial, um, which is a little bit different. You guys are uh, very well experienced in quasi-judicial legislative decisions. This is a legislative decision. Um, it's pursuant to Article 4 of the Uniform um, Development Ordinance uh, for the town. And upon review, and there's a preliminary review by technical review committee, staff, planning board, um, and Kelly will cover all those things. But ultimately, after um, the presentation today, the board will have to, um, one, either approve the application, approve the application with conditions acceptable to the applicant, den or deny the application. Uh, you can table to continue consideration um, under certain circumstances. Um, or you can uh, vote to return the application to the planning board for additional review for things that you think um, need to be further reviewed or uh, further provided. Um, so those are your the general options that you have moving forward today. Um, in terms of um, approval, I mean, ultimately, uh, there's going to be a review, and um, there's if it meets the standards within the ordinance, and you feel it meets the standards in the ordinance, those are your options to take action. Um, if you have any additional questions when you get to the end about um, any of those options, please let me know. But otherwise, I think you guys have been through this multiple times. So. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I went ahead and, and brought up the site plan that also has an overlay for the landscape plan that's being proposed. Um, just so as I run through all the items, you have something to equate it to. Um, the applicant for this site plan review is House Engineering. We do have two members of House Engineering available today, David Neff and Brian Sewell, should there be any questions. Um, I also think they have a, a presentation they'd like to provide as well. Uh, the request is for construction of a four-story, 90-unit hotel, along with all the necessary site improvements to West Pheasant Avenue. The property is currently vacant. It is located within the village at Max Head Hotel District, um, and it is also located in the Hotel Overlay District. As far as the zoning classification for the adjoining properties, um, the most notable here is going to be that the properties to the west, uh, this is Roanoke Shore subdivision. It's um, zoned residentially. It's zoned R3 based <coughs> buffer yard requirement here. Um, then a X flood zone, but our local elevation standard here is nine feet. And they're proposing a first floor elevation at 9.1. So there's compliance with that. Um, the land use plan has this property located within the general commercial district. Um, and so we do find that the proposal is consistent with that designation. Um, as Attorney Womble has already noted, this is a permitted use. Um, I would also like to say that section 9.1 24.5 of the UDO. Um, it states that in cases where the standards 
um, of this section are in conflict with the standards contained in Article 10, the commercial design standards, the more restrictive standards should apply. So as we go through all the standards, um, I'll let you know if there's a more restrictive standard that we're going to apply um, over what would normally be um, required in the overlay district. Um, lot coverage here, um, it's broken up um, into different maximums. So for a hotel between 49 feet and 60 feet, the maximum building coverage cannot exceed 35% of the lot area. Parking coverage cannot exceed 45% of the lot area. And they need to have a minimum of 20% of the lot area landscaped. Um, the proposed building coverage is at 12.9. The proposed parking coverage is at 36.18. And they have about 28.2% of landscaped area. So we do find compliance in this um, in this area as well. Um, because this uh, proposed height here is going to be 60 feet and their proposed height is 59.1, so we have compliance there as well. With regard to architectural design, um, section 10.82 states um, that commercial design standards shall apply to all building construction or remodeling projects. Um, that this project must adhere to the standards that are set forth in Vision 2 of the UDO building design. Um, staff has reviewed the proposal against um, this, the building design standards, building size and dimension standards, building <coughs> height, architectural design elements, site design, and building footprint orientation. A few examples lending to the compliance of the proposed structure are the incorporation of dormers and other roof articulations, covered porch area, screened um, all rooftop installations. I actually don't think they have any rooftop installations proposed or mechanical equipment um, proposed on this. Uh, residential style, double hung windows, gable brackets, workable shutters, and the desired column trim. With regard to parking, uh, the required parking for hotel states that it shall provide parking at one parking space for each hotel unit without kitchen facilities. Um, if a unit does have kitchen facilities, the parking requirement is slightly increased. Um, but if you've um, had the opportunity to look at the floor plan, which we can look at um, momentarily, you'll see that no kitchen facilities have been proposed. So with that, um, because this is a 90 room hotel, they would be required to have 90 parking spaces. They proposed a total of 93 parking spaces, and so therefore parking would be compliant. Um, section of the UDO uh, surface materials requires that 20% of the area dedicated to parking should be provided in permeable surfaces. Um, looking at the site plan, you'll note um, this whole area here adjacent to 158 is being proposed in a permeable surface. Um, that's gonna bring them up to 22.9% um, of permeable surfaces here. The UDO requires um, that when parking abuts a right of way, there has to be a 10 foot wide landscape buffer. Um, and if they have provided that um, adjacent to the right of ways, um, the Forest Street right of way, the Lakeside Street right the 158 right of way. Um, we talk about the uh, need for increased buffering along this western property boundary because it is located adjacent to a residential district. Um, we call that the commercial transitional protective yard. Um, it requires at least a buffer that is 25 feet in width along the entire length of the lot. The buffer shall consist of three rows of plant materials. Um, so as you can see um, along this area. <coughs> um, building setback requirements for hotels over three stories states that for hotels west of NC-12, 
a minimum 25 foot natural or landscape buffer shall be provided along the northern and southern boundaries. This is one of those sections that's not in the hotel overlay. It's actually part of the village hotel district, so it's more stringent. Um, the hotel overlay actually doesn't require this, but because it's part of the village, um, it has been applied. And as you can see, they do have the 25 foot um, setback with buffer along the northern and southern boundaries here. So we find that that is compliant as well. Um, interior parking lot landscaping requires that the area specifically dedicated to parking stalls, um, that 10% of that shall be dedicated to um, interior parking lot vegetation. And um, they've provided approximately 12% of interior vegetation, so there's compliance with that as well. Um, section 10.93.3.8 um, of the UDO speaks to the requirement that you um, would need to either preserve percent of the site in existing mature vegetation. If you cannot do that, you would need to plant 15% of the lot area in vegetation. You'll see here in, in this um, red hashed area that they have proposed to preserve a small area of existing mature vegetation here, um, but they aren't even counting that towards their total. Um, they're actually going to go ahead and plant 18% um, of the lot area, 8% of the total lot area, new plantings. Um, which would include the required number of trees, shrubs, plants, and grasses. So we do find that that requirement has been met as well. Um, of course, um, if this is approved and it's constructed, uh, a compliant lighting plan need to be provided, um, the appropriate fixtures, and of course we'll conduct a lot of it prior to um, any type of approvals. The applicant... Um, in terms of their water and sewage disposal, um, they're including uh, management through on-site wastewater technology using an advanced treatment system in combination with four separate low pressure disposal fields. The average daily design flow of 11,000 gallons per day requires approval through the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, the environmental health section to the town when it is granted um, but we know that no development permits um, will be issued prior to receipt of those state approvals. Looking here at the site plan, you'll see where this, um, the on-site treatment has been proposed in this area. Um, the town engineer, uh, two points of ingress and egress are shown along Lakeside Drive. It's gonna be um, here and here. The UDO indicates that curb cuts in excess of one on streets other than 158 and C12, US 64264 or State Road 1243 are allowed if the or that more than one curb cut is desirable to facilitate traffic flow. Staff feels that these two um, separate access points from Lakeside are appropriate to facilitate traffic flow in conjunction with emergency vehicle access and sanitation um, truck access as well. We know that a loading zone has been provided in compliance with the code. Um, also note that uh, a traffic impact analysis has been prepared by VHB um, and a traffic consultant for the applicant um, has submitted this to NCDOT for review. I do believe that perhaps NCDOT has provided comments at this point. Um, so Brian Sewell or David Neff can speak to that um, following this presentation. Um, the existing traffic data was collected in early September um, of 2022 to review existing intersection turning movements along East and West Lakeside Street from both South Croatan Highway and South Virginia Deer Trail. The collected data was analyzed based on current roadway geometrics and traffic counts with no proposed improvements recommended at full project build out. The traffic consultant will be available to present the findings of the report at this meeting. 
Um, and he will be available via Zoom um, once I conclude my presentation and address any questions that you may have. He'll, he'll be prepared to discuss um, the traffic impact analysis. Uh, the town engineer has also reviewed the stormwater management plan. Um, <coughs> kind of lengthy comments, but I would like to have them on record for um, anyone listening or down uh, looking at this down the road. Um, the proposal is being reviewed under Section 11.4 General Standards for commercial mixed use or all non single family um, development. This includes multifamily development. Um, and it requires development of a property to provide stormwater control measures to retain runoff from a 4.3 inch design storm. Questions have arisen as to how this application should be reviewed regarding stormwater management and whether the proposal would be considered as part of the village at Nags Head stormwater master plan. The North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, Division of Energy, Mineral and Land Resources staff has been contacted to discuss this matter. The application would not be viewed as a common plan of development um, and it would not be considered as part of the system. So it is appropriate to review this under the current state and local stormwater regulations. During the review process, a negative easement was discovered to be applied to the property. The negative easement was applied in conjunction with the 1984 approval of the gas station um, immediately to the east of the subject shown on the site plan. Um, the verbiage of the negative easement is designed for the purpose of assuring the availability of adequate drainage for the gas station property. The proposed stormwater management design for the hotel proposal accounts for rainfall runoff from the proposed improvements in addition to the gas station property. In total, stormwater management improvements for both on-site runoff and for off-site runoff are designed to manage runoff volume for an approximate five-inch rainfall event, which is in excess of the town's 4.3-inch rainfall event. So um, it's very technical terminology uh, for me. Essentially, uh, the hotel property is um, capturing and managing um, not only their required 4.3 inch storm event, um, but closer to a five inch storm event, they're also capturing from the gas station property. Um, review of published data um, to include the National Wetland Inventory Map and on site soil investigation do not indicate the presence of any hydric soils or, or wetlands on this site. Um, an NCDEQ high density stormwater permit will be required. Copies will need to be provided to the town in advance of issuance of a building permit. And of course, engineer certification will need to be provided to the town um, in association with construction record drawings prior to uh, issuance of CO should the project be approved. Um, with regard to erosion and sedimentation control, uh, the building permit submission for land disturbing activity shall include the ground stabilization and material handling and inspection, record keeping and reporting detail sheets that are required by the NCG01 NPDES construction program. And the applicant shall provide for a certificate of coverage through the NPDES construction program prior to land disturbance activities occurring. A pre-construction conference will need to be had um, with the appropriate staff prior to any land disturbance. Um, with regard to fire, um, the project is required to comply with the NC Fire Protection Code. Um, and Deputy Chief Shane Height has reviewed this. He has provided some comments that are um, essentially just basic code requirements, but has determined that the, the submittal is compliant um, with the fire prevention code. The same for public works. The public works director has reviewed the proposal um, and find that the site plan um, is compliant as it's been proposed. Uh, for staff analysis, staff finds that the proposal is consistent with the applicable use and development standards as well as land use policies. Staff finds that the proposed stormwater management plan satisfies the requirements of the negative easement via 
an approved alternative drainage plan, which accommodates the 4.3 inch storm event for both the proposed hotel development, as well as the existing improvements for the gas station property. Article four, section four of the UDO discusses procedures for subdivision approvals. Um, records reflect that the current property owner for this hotel site owns lots 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 22, 23, 26, and 27 in their entirety and a portion of lots 24, 29, 30, and 31. The remaining portion of those four lots are owned by Harrell Acquisitions LLC. Um, until 1999, this entire tract um, was in common ownership. To date, while the boundaries are referenced in transferring deeds, there hasn't been a formal subdivision um, approval pursuant to the requirements of the UDO for these parcels. So we are requesting um, that if you choose to approve this request, that you place a condition on the approval um, that the required subdivision um, and lot recombination be completed prior to issuance of any permits. Um, with that in mind, staff does recommend approval of the site plan with the notation that the subdivision and the recombination plat um, be provided in advance of issuing any permits. Um, I, we would also note um, that following this, uh, a notation be provided on the site plan should it be approved, um, noting that the stormwater, that the approved stormwater plan accounts for both the 4.3 inch storm um, for this site, as well as the gas station site, we would use the parcel number or pin number. Um, and then we'll also follow up with an approval letter from staff with these conditions spelled out and ask that both be recorded at the register of deeds um, so that moving forward, um, it, will, it will be known um, uh, that the approved stormwater plan needs to be maintained and continue to manage the stormwater um, as has been designed. The planning board did review this at their August 16th, 2022 meeting. They voted four to two to recommend approval of the site plan. Um, following the August 16th approval, the planning board has revised their stormwater management plan for that additional runoff that we've talked about. And as I noted, VHP um, has conducted that traffic impact analysis. So I will say that uh, when we presented this to the planning board, um, those items were not included. However, they do seem to be um, uh, above and beyond what was required at that time. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Question by two. <coughs> Kelly, <coughs> excuse me, two questions. Number one, I noticed on page 14 um, of the site plan, there's a sign location and it says town approved. I didn't mention, I didn't hear any mention of a sign being approved already or location being approved or what would have to happen with that? So um, we didn't review it for a sign location. A lot of people go ahead and put that on there so that we can determine that the site triangle is being met, um, the 10 by 70. But prior to any sign being installed, that would need to come in under separate application and would receive a separate review and approval. Okay. And then the other thing, they mentioned breakfast in the middle of the floor plan, um, no kitchen shown. How would, would those extra spots accompany any kind of kitchen or what would, would those extra parking spots that they put in, would that, you know, meet the required parking if they did add breakfast? So I do think they are going to provide um, breakfast and, and maybe they can speak to that. There will be um, the opportunity for people to grab a little bit of breakfast on their way out, but there will not be a full kitchen, nor will individual hotel units contain kitchen facilities. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kane. Oh, thank you. Just real quick, you talked about uh, the re more restrictive standard would be applied where mm -hmm. applicable, and we talked about the north and south boundaries, and it was applied at 25 feet. Yes. What would be the less restrictive? 20 feet or? Um, well, so actually in the hotel overlay, um, there would be no um, requirement. It would just be your standard setback. Um, sure. So there would be no landscape requirement. 
And I did not, while reading it or listening to the presentation, was there any other restrict, more restrictive standard that was applied here? Uh, no, it was simply with regard to um, the 25 foot uh, buffer on the uh, north and south. Thank you. Just for a public record, can you uh, elaborate on the stormwater and where it's captured? I've had some people concerns about that from some citizens. So, Sure. Um, if it's okay with you, I would probably defer to our town manager, David Ryan, Certainly. Um, to discuss this one more. Hey, you got a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So there, there's several different stormwater control measures that are being proposed on site, and they are around the periphery of the site. There is a basin that runs here along Forest Street to a infiltration basin that runs along the very west side of the boundary. Um, there are culvert pipes under each one of these driveway connections. So you have continuous flow and connectivity throughout um, all the way to the southern boundary and the right of way adjoining Lakeside Street. There is all which then continues on along um, this side right here, which borders the north side of the gas station. And then in addition to that, there are a uh, improvement for a swale here within the NCDOT right of way. Um, and don't want to leave out the permeable pavement, which is also considered a stormwater control measure um, for the site. So, so basically, all along the perimeter of the site, they're capturing runoff and interior to the site with the permeable pavement. The influence, um, what type is that on the west side? So so this is uh, an infiltration basin. Um, off, I, I believe it's on average about uh, two, two and a half feet deep, um, which that is also bordered by landscape. And and so this is, this is all infiltration area plus landscaping. So you have the benefit of capturing runoff, infiltrating, and then you also have the added benefit of evapotranspiration uptake with that landscape port. Thank you. David, um, there were calculations presented for the existing uh, service station because that stormwater had to be accommodated. And so I saw those calculations on the, on the site plan. Are there any structures that in other words, that site, you know, I presume is not being modified in any way on that site. So were there any flumes or other structures um, or simply uh, pavement slopes that are carrying the water to those swales that are designated for that? Yes. Let me see if I can find that sheet. So primarily the gas station, there's there were some elevations that were taken along the gas station and some arrows noting where the directional flow is. So predominantly um, from the center of the site, that sheet flow um, for the western portion of the gas station site flows to the west. And so that mm -hmm. will be captured within this perimeter swale right here. Um, there's also a small swale improvement right here to go ahead and capture uh, this corner of drainage. And then there's also a perimeter swale up here on the hotel site, which is capturing some of the runoff that is going to the north. Um, there is a low spot right here at this corner of the gas station. So it's got two available flow paths. It can within this swale out here between the multi-unit. Okay. So primarily sheet flow is how that's going to be managed. Thank you. Any other questions for David? <clears throat> then I, we can hear from the applicant. If it's okay, would, um, would they be allowed to go ahead and do the presentation from your traffic engineer? Absolutely, sure. Okay. Yep. Good morning, can everyone hear me? We can. Yeah, I'll try to share my screen real quick and get the presentation up and running. So you should be seeing a uh, title slide to my presentation. Uh, we are. 
Okay, great. Um, happy to be here today. My name is Jody Lewis of VHP Engineering. Um, thank you um, to the board for having us here. Um, I've already talked quite a bit about the site, so I won't um, bore you too much with that, but um, it is a nine room hotel being accessed um, on West Lakeside Street. Um, the road itself um, is a, a residential street. Um, it's serving residents to the west and the gas station to the east and can be accessed by two driveways along uh, West Lakeside Street and accessing US 158. Um, pavement markings include just uh, crosswalk markings across um, West Lakeside Street and the only traffic control or stop signs along the way. Uh, we, we did form a TIA. Um, we scoped the TIA uh, through conversation with NCDOT staff and with town staff. And we arrived at, um, we're gonna analyze weekday AM and PM peak hours and weekend peak as well. And analyze two offsite intersections, um, Lakeside at 158 and Lakeside at NC12. And the two driveways, obviously, and we performed the TIA to NCDOT requirements in terms of the analysis. Uh, we did collect data, has been mentioned already, in September, um, Tuesday, September 15th, and Saturday, September 17th. We were assured by NCDOT that even though we obviously missed the peak uh, for data collection in the summer, um, that these dates would be sufficient to represent you know, traffic conditions that might be present in the peak of the season. Um, to grow our traffic to the analysis year for the build year of 2025, we assume the 1.5% annual growth rate to apply to the existing volumes to build up to 2025. And so this is just a screenshot from the TI um, that you should have in your hands already um, of the existing party movement counts at the intersections. Um, the numbers without um, any brackets or parentheses are the existing AN numbers. The numbers with the Parentheses are the existing PM numbers, and with the brackets are the weekday peak numbers. As you can see, not a whole lot of traffic coming and going from Lakeside, either east or west of uh, US 158 or NC 12. Um, the major major volumes are obviously along US 158 Fulton Highway. Um, so we. We applied 1.5% for three years to those volumes and we generated what we're calling our 2025 no-build um, traffic volumes. We arrived at year 2025 for analysis because the um, hotel should open in the summer of 2024. So we went one year beyond um, just to assure that we're getting full occupancy of the hotel for trip generation purposes. So for trip generation uh, for the 90 room hotel, um, I tried to highlight the the peaks, um, AM peak during the week would be 38 trips generated. PM peak would be 39 trips generated. And on Saturday peak would be 65 trips generated. So then we distribute those trips. Uh, we, we assign 50% north and south um, of the site um, along US 158 and NC12. We assume 20% would come and go on NC12 and remaining 80% would come and go on US 158. And that's on the graphic to the left. On the right is uh, the actual traffic numbers being generated by the, the site. And you can see not very significant um, gener generation of, of sites from the trip or trips from the site. And then we overlay those onto the 2025 no build numbers to arrive at the 2025 build um, turning them accounts. Uh, so you see, again, very low movements um, coming and going from the site, turning left or going through and at US 158 and even fewer over at um, NC12. So we ran the analysis again for DOT requirements and you know, existing conditions are, are operating fine, it seems. Um, lowest level service is a D and Keep in mind, when we're looking at uh, unsignalized intersections, the level of service is really is only driven by the delays um, being experienced by the vehicles on the side streets that are controlled by stop signs. So that's why you see a lot of um, blank spaces on this uh, display. Um, the only F that we're, we realized was um, at US 158 and East and West Lakeside during the Saturday peak, and that was, uh, as you can see, 76.9 and 57.1 seconds of delay for those 
east and westbound movements. Again, that's pretty typical and was expected. Um, queuing, um, I know it may be a concern, but the maximum queues were only about four vehicles or about 100 feet um, during the peaks on Saturday. So again, no significant findings um, for increased vehicular delays or um, increased traffic queues. So these are, this is just a shot of the um, resulting geometrics and lane uh, traffic control that are recommended. Uh, really no roadway improvements um, at US 158 or NC12 maintain the existing single lane approaches on the side street. Um, no main line improvements are recommended at either. And then at the driveways, again, just utilize the existing pavement width to have vehicles enter and exit um, the hotel. So quick conclusions, um, no level of service or queue issues were found. Um, a signal was not warranted. Um, at US 158 due to the low volumes of traffic on the, on the side streets and no improvements recommended for the existing roadways either. That concludes um, everything I've prepared, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, questions, I'll start down here with uh, Commissioner Sanders. Not this, no. Yes, sir, Mr. thank Mr. you. Commissioner Cahoon. Mine is a comment more of anything. I appreciate the traffic study. I do think that it would behoove both the developer, the town, and DOT to have a stoplight at Lakeside. We've talked about it in the past. Mm -hmm. I think now would be an ideal time for the three entities to get together and jointly pay for a stoplight. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be important both for the hotel as well as residents of Lakeside um, to have a stoplight. And I would like to see the town pursue a joint venture with the other entities. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I add something to what Commissioner Cohn said? Yes. I'm, I am a little concerned too about pedestrian traffic crossing the bypass to the uh, two popular businesses right across the street and Ice Cream Street down the beach road. So I agree with you. Well, right. it's not a condition of approval. It's yeah. just that I would like to see us do a joint venture and have all the parties come to the table and that way nobody has the major impact of a DOT's already said they're not going to pay for stoplight if it was a joint venture maybe they would consider it okay. all right thank you I would say for the developer if they could get DOT to pay a third and us to pay a third it'd be a heck of a deal and it would certainly be <laughs> worth doing um, so uh, I, I agree to that extent thank you um, thank you. Then I think that we are done with uh, the VHB discussion. And um, so, applicant, if you wish to speak. Good to see you guys. Brian Sewell, House Engineering. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm going to start off by thanking staff. Um, Max has always taken pride, and I've got a little insight on that, on their employees. Um, and to, the, to that fact, I'd like to thank specifically Kelly and the town engineer, Mr. Ryan. They have been a great asset in helping us work through this process for months, not just a few weeks. Um, we have tried our best to go above and beyond what's required um, for the ordinance. For example, stormwater 4.3, we've designed a 5. The state only requires 1.5. We're, we're collecting from the negative easements, the traffic studies. We've tried to go above and beyond, and we actually took a month off because we listened, we heard the concerns about the traffic. So during that month time, we took the, the we listened to the to staff, the boards, the public, and addressed those concerns. And I would like to thank Jody for being here today. Um, they did a very comprehensive report and I'd like to thank them for that. Um, I think that this project will be a very good thing for the town of Maxit. It will be a great accompaniment to the sound side um, event center. It will also provide some fresh rooms. I think that was brought up before for people to stay in. Um, and it will create employment, which I know we're, we're talking about affordable housing employees, but it will create employment. It will help there'll be generate tax income for the city. It will also, it will be vendors, things like that. There will be income that will benefit and go back into this community. This is a one-off. This is not a chain that's proposed to come in here. This is unique to the town and accent as shown. Is there anything I can address to the board? Mr. Sears. 
Nothing. Commissioner Kane. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Having seen the presentation and asked our questions, then um, for the purpose of discussion, if any, a motion would be in order. I make a motion that we approve the site plan for the 90 unit hotel in at Whalebone with the staff recommendation that we have an approved subdivision plat addressing the portions of lots 24, 29, 30, and 31, and a recombination plat addressing lots 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 22, 23, 26, and 27 be approved and filed at the Dare County Register of Deeds prior to the issuance of any development permits for the proposed hotel project. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Commissioner Sears. With respect, can we also add that they, she wants the maintenance of those wells uh, maintained, recorded in the deed as well? So What's staff it? actually recommended two um, specific uh, conditions in her presentation. I saw the applicant nodding, so I think they were acceptable to the applicant. Is that correct? And that was that there would be a notation on the site plan that their stormwater management was accepting the um, stormwater from the adjacent parcel and that that would also be included in the approval letter subject to the board's decision and that both of those documents would be recorded. Um, that will clean up the negative easement that was referenced in the staff report um, and I believe the, the applicant was ex acceptable, agreed to that. Is the motion or amenable to that? Yeah. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, and the second. And the, all right, very good. Then we have an amended motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll start anywhere. Just yeah, we'll start with you. Um, you know, the attorney at the beginning talked about what our role was here, and it, it talked about if this application meets the standard of the ordinance. Um, uh, the planning director's uh, comment: staff finds that the proposal is consistent with the applicable use and development standards, as well as relevant land use policies. I think the applicant has demonstrated a need and have complied with all of our ordinances and requirements um, in some cases gone above and beyond. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see that the town uh, had a more restrictive standard on that north and south boundaries and that applied 25 feet. I mean, that's that's good. So uh, I, I've heard the concerns that have been expressed both personally or in person and then the emails we received. Um, but I think the applicant has demonstrated that he's met our ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank you. All right, very good. Commissioner Sanders. I don't have anything. I mean, he has met and exceeded all the town codes and ordinances. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Kuhn. We all have had a lot of comments about this proposal. Mm -hmm. um, I know the neighborhood is extremely concerned and should be. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where they live. But I also want everybody to understand that any plan that comes forward to the town that meets the ordinances, mm -hmm. we don't get to put extra conditions on it. We don't get to deny per se. Correct. Um, no matter what the race feelings may be, um, we have to live by our code of ordinances. Mm -hmm. And if we don't like our code of ordinances, we have to change them. But you don't change them after the door is opened. Right. You right. have to change it before something has been presented. And this site plan meets all of our code and therefore it should be adopted yeah i, I agree with that um and before we vote i you know as a somebody who's also engaged in this i compliment you on the site plan i know you put a lot on there and it is tight and it is it is well done so um i i, I can appreciate that all right then we have a motion and a second uh, any further discussion hearing none all in favor signify by saying aye uh -huh. aye Opposed? All right. Thank you. Uh, the board will be in recess for um, about 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Okay. All right. The board is returned to, um, to business, and that would bring us to uh, old business tabled from previous meetings and the traffic control map. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, at the uh, September 7th board meeting, uh, the board received comments from a number of property owners in the vicinity of 4036 South Virginia Dare Trail. 
uh, which is the location of Nags Head Pizza Company, uh, regarding uh, numerous issues, one being uh, parking along the side of the road. Uh, the board directed staff to do an analysis of this and make a recommendation back to the board today on whether or not uh, a no parking area is warranted on the west side of 12 uh, in this area. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our new police chief, Perry Hale, to come and give his analysis. Chief. Good morning again, uh, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, as the manager just stated, I was uh, directed to monitor traffic issues uh, around 4036 at the last board meeting from several comments uh, at the public comment section. During that time, I had recently uh, heard a little bit of, about some concerns of traffic the, the week prior to the board meeting. So I already had staff monitoring this from Labor Day weekend up until the date of the memo that I pre uh, presented for this uh, meeting today, which was the 27th of September. During that time, uh, from September the 3rd, uh, police department staff had completed a total of 41 field contacts, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for this uh, location at 4036, which does not include normal patrols um, that staff are, are out on. And if they see something during a normal patrol, they would direct attention to it. That the 41 times was just specifically documented random times during business hours, which I believe they're open from four to nine, Monday through Friday, and then to 10 o'clock uh, on the weekends. Uh, during that time, uh, there were uh, one vehicle that was noted that was parked on the west side shoulder. Um, it was not known if this vehicle was visiting the establishment as the vehicle was parked directly into the vacant lot at 4038. There were no other vehicles parked on the shoulder in front of 4036, and then the parking lot was noted that it was not full during the time that the vehicle was parked on that shoulder as well. If that vehicle was at the pizza joint or just parked on the shoulder, visiting somewhere else or not. Um, it was also noted uh, in that contact that the vehicle that was parked on that shoulder did not create any issues of traffic um, issues from parking or any sight distance issues coming out, exiting or entering of the establishment at 4036. Um, I was provided a picture uh, when I met with a homeowner. Um, previous to this, um, and that picture had five vehicles that were parked on the shoulders. It appeared it was a black and white picture and it was taken from a distance. Two of those vehicles could have been parked on the east side of NC-12, which would be in violation of uh, parking on the multi-use path if it was blocked, et cetera. Um, the other vehicles appear to be on the west side, but traffic was not uh, impacted any from those vehicles that were parked there. Um, <clears throat> I even went back to April. Um, and pull calls for service at this address. We had two other calls for service documented during that time. They were not related to any traffic issues or concerns whatsoever. They were other issues that were called upon for the police department to go there for, not dealing with any traffic. Uh, based on the information collected, uh, we have not observed any parking issues that have interfered with any traffic or sight distance of, of vehicles leaving the property. I know we're in the off season. Um, this could have played a, a, a part with the numbers and, uh, visits to the establishment, but we were monitoring this during Labor Day weekend. I thought Labor Day weekend was a pretty busy time here, uh, but we had no uh, calls for service or any violations or notice of concern from our staff while they were patrolling or monitoring specifically for parking uh, issues at that address. It's my recommendation that we look into the start of the next season and continue to monitor this. Um, and if issues arise, we make adjustments then. But if the board is inclined to establish a no parking zone now, we would uh, recommend it be designated 100 foot north and south of the entrance at 4036. And that would be the purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, for the purpose of keeping sight distance clear for vehicles entering or exiting that driveway to the business. And this would be consistent with other areas in town um, that we have recently updated. More than happy to take any questions or. I don't remember where I'm supposed to start, but I'll start down here. <laughs> I don't have any questions. Have questions. Yeah. Since I brought this up, um, I appreciate the report that you gave us. Um, I'm also appreciate the fact that you have suggested that at the beginning of next season, which to me would be in April, since Easter is our first really busy weekend, that you make that observation and then bring us back some further information, please. Okay. 
Right. I would agree with Commissioner Coon. All right, great. Thank you very much, Chief. Appreciate yes, that. Sir. All right, so that brings us to, um, actually, I think before we go to the town attorney, and I think that we can <coughs> do the manager's item. With the committee yeah. reports. Yeah. Yeah. Committee New reports. Business. Yes, committee reports. Thank you. I'll start down here. Nothing to report this time, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Um, nothing to report on that, but I will inform the town that at the last CRC meeting that we gave direction staff to bring back possibly some new rule language as it's going to relate to placement of septic tanks <coughs> on the oceanfront. That's great. Hallelujah. <clears throat> yeah. Appreciate that, Mr. Green. Yes, sir. Nothing from Jeanette Spear and uh, the planning director gave a update on the voluntary septic subscription service meeting. <coughs> Okay. Thank That's you. Very good. Planning planning director also gave an update on the shoreline committee. So, right. Right. very good. We're good. I, I would mention one, one additional thing. Uh, we had a pedestrian, a first pedestrian planning committee. Sorry, I forgot that. We did have a pedestrian planning um, that we had pretty good attendance out of that too. We even had uh, one of the ladies that's on there from out of town participate by phone. Very good. Um, had to leave a little early to get back to work, but. Very good input and participation by all members. Staff, Dave, David Ryan and Andy gave great background and presentations, and uh, I look forward. I think we're going to make some progress. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. You. We're looking to try to get something together by the January time frame, uh -huh. you know, and so right now we're just working on a ranking criteria uh, that we could use to, to score projects, and then they looked at the list of projects you saw in the CIP and then also what other projects were, were included in our past pedestrian plan. And we certainly asked them to look at anything that they wanted to bring forward, you know, just based on their knowledge of the community. So it, I think it'll be a good working group. Good. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right. And uh, <laughs> manager's items. Okay. So there, there are three things here. I guess the first item, and all these will be very brief. I'll cover the first item and then David will come and do the second two items. Um, so legislation for dangerous holes on the beach. Uh, this is something that the board has been working on for a while. And we just wanted to provide an update that we have received now seven re resolutions from various coastal communities. Those would include Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hawk, Southern Shores, Duck, Atlantic Beach, Oak Island, and Surf City, in addition to the town of Nags Head. So that leaves a total of eight. Uh, and so uh, now we would begin the process to try to draft some legislation and, and get with uh, legislators, most likely uh, Representative Hannig. Uh, we have been informed that Atlantic Beach has also reached out to uh, Representative McElraft in that area. And that's another avenue to try and get this pushed forward. And so we'll probably be working with uh, Town Attorney John Lighty and, and the mayor uh, to try to put something together to get to a legislator to start that process. So we we, we are moving forward with that. Um, Great. Thank you. And then with regards to public works, um, I just wanted to say that David uh, has really been leading this project internally. Uh, he's been doing an outstanding job uh, coordinating between the, the design team and our staff to try to make sure that the plans reflect what the staff really needs to have in this new pro in this new complex you know I, I just take from all the board's comments so far that what we're really trying to do is provide the resources for staff to to function well into the future and give them what they need and so there's been numerous meetings with David and the architect and the engineers uh, to go over the plans <coughs> to make sure that the staff in public works understands what's in the plans and and provide input on the things that they need, not only in the building design, but also in the um, equipment that would be uh, serviced in the building. And so, uh, and I appreciate Nancy and, and putting together meetings with her superintendents to go through everything. And, and there has been numerous meetings, but uh, with that, David will give a brief update on where we are. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andy. Um, as, as Andy had said, it's really been a staff driven process up to this point. Um, getting staff involved, getting their feedback in order to make sure 
that we address all their specific needs. Um, as we've been going through the process, uh, we have completed the planning board review and you will be seeing this plan for your review uh, at the November meeting. But uh, uh, before we get to that point, um, the, we've been working with the architect to go ahead and finalize the plans and advertise them to bid. Uh, it was advertised earlier this week and we anticipate uh, bids to be received on November 1st. Uh, we have been talking with the architect about outreach with contractors. Um, I know that we've had some issues with uh, recent projects for vertical construction and, and getting uh, bidders uh, to, to bid on uh, some of our recent projects. So we're trying to get out ahead of that. And so uh, the architect has been doing some outreach and he's hoping that uh, we he can get six to seven bidders on this project. Um, he has been in constant communications uh, throughout the, the process. And um, uh, from there, uh, once we go through board review, um, it's acquiring the, the final several permits, uh, one of them being a uh, Division of Coastal Management CAM, a major permit um, that was submitted back in July. Um, right now it's in the 75 day review process. And there is a uh, also a stormwater management permit um, this is one of three um, that, that remains um, to be uh, reviewed and final approval issued. But we are on track with the schedule that was presented to you uh, earlier this summer. Um, and then on the back end of it, we do have the financing that we will be going through. Uh, but just wanted to give the board an update that we are maintaining our schedule. We are moving forward. Um, as uh, as planned. So I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. And I'd just like to add a, a couple of things just to remind the board. So as Dave, David mentioned, I, we're receiving the bids. Is it the 3rd or the 1st of November? Uh, uh, 1st of November. 1st of November. And we have left in a rebid period in case we don't receive three bids. And that would give another 10 days, I believe. But the board had scheduled a retreat on November 16th and 17th. And what we were looking at was a full day on the 16th and a half day on the 17th. The 16th would be the day that we would informally look at the bids, uh, but we wouldn't ask the board to actually uh, award the bid until the December regular meeting. That would give us more time to go through them because we'll have just received them. But we also wanted to kind of cover the bids and the, the total cost of the project with the board and get some feedback uh, because there could be a lot of variables that would affect what moves forward. Um, with that said, in talking with some of the commissioners prior to this meeting, um, there may be a desire to ask whether or not we modify the dates of the retreat and maybe Commissioner Cahoon, if you'd like to. When we scheduled the November 16th, it was we were due to have a mid-month meeting, mm -hmm. um, which I was not gonna be at because we'd never really have a mid-month meeting in November. Right. But um, since that's only gonna be down for retreat, I wonder if the board would consider possibly keeping the retreat on the Thursday, the 17th. 17th, and possibly having the full day of the retreat on the 18th. If that doesn't work with everybody else's schedule, I understand, but I would like to participate in that retreat. Um, sure. But if everybody could check their schedules. Um, I think it's important to do the retreat and I don't want to stop the retreat in any way. Right. I'm for it. I'm good. But if the 18th would work for, <coughs> or can we do the retreat the 17th and 18th? Actually, it's better. <laughs> the 17th would be the half day. Okay. So what we were proposing for the 17th would be a half day. And what we have scheduled are departmental presentations. Each department was going to give a presentation on their initiatives and, and their strategic plans. And so we would keep that day the same. And then we would cover some of these larger items on the full day, which would include the public works review. And so we would basically just flip flop Wednesday, Friday for Wednesday. Mm -hmm. good. Everybody good? Okay, that works. Could I ask Thank you, David, a question? Sure. David, on the public services project, I still want to call it public works, sorry. I know, it's um, hard. I know that you're in the middle of a camera review for your major permit. Yes. Um, and I know that that's a 75 day time frame for outside agencies to comment. 
is that going to screw up their schedule? It, as long as we can maintain that initial 75 day period, we will maintain our schedule. If we go beyond that, then that can be somewhat problematic. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, right now that 75th day is the November 12th. <clears throat> so we, we have to uh, go to the, we're planning to go to the local government commission in January. We need all of our permits in hand and we need to provide them with all information about a month ahead of time. So having the permits in hand at the beginning of December is gonna be critical. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. And just to piggyback onto that, our consultant has been following up with the representatives from Division of Coastal Management, uh, just to see if there's any issues with the review. So they've been staying on top of that. We did have a pre-project scoping meeting and you know any concerns or comments uh, were, were given at that time and were incorporated into the plan work. So at this point, we don't anticipate any major hurdles or issues that would cause a delay. Um, so um, we we just hope that um, that nothing comes up during the course of review that will um, delay our schedule. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, David. And then I think David was gonna go ahead and just give a brief update on beach nourishment. Yep. Okay, um, it's been just uh, over a month since we completed our most recent post Orion um, restoration project. Um, it took about 21 days in total to go ahead and complete the southern four and a half uh, miles of town. Um, the project was completed on August 27th with the beach fill operations and then the mobilization took place uh, up to two weeks uh, after that. Um, at this point, the only thing that we have remaining is some sand fence and sprigging, um, which we are currently trying to get scheduled here within the next month or so uh, for that installation. And then that will complete the remaining scope of services. Now, the original planned amount of beach fill was 611,000 cubic yards. We did have a contingency that was um, an allowance that we had uh, for additional beach fill. Uh, there was an additional amount of uh, 2,847 cubic yards, and therefore there was a uh, change order um, in the amount of $26,640 uh, for that uh, additional uh, beach fill placement. So um, before you is a request to amend the beach nourishment maintenance capital project ordinance to go ahead and cover this amount. <clears throat> How's the beach down there since the project? It, it's been taking a beating. <laughs> um, and I, I've been down there when we've, we've seen some changes in the beach and I know that we've put out some information online to talk about post nourishment, how the beach can be impacted. Um, but what we have done is maintained a level of protection to those residences down south. So um, we've achieved our primary objective. We know that Mother Nature is going to move that sand around, um, but um, it's it, it's done its job. I believe we opened the beach to beach driving today mm -hmm. and then the next it's our fishing tournament starts tomorrow. And so things are, are looking up for that. Good. Thank you. Would you like a motion? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the beach <coughs> nourishment maintenance capital project ordinance amendment number five in the amount of $14,388,364. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Andy? Uh, nothing else right now. Okay. All right. Um, then that would bring us back up to items referred to and presentations from the town attorney uh, and a closed session. Yes, Mr. Mayor, the, the the only thing I have at this point is the uh, closed session. And if you would like me for to craft a motion, I can do that. Yes, if you would, please. All right. So uh, the board needs to enter closed session as allowed by General Statute 143-318.11A1 in order to review and approve closed session minutes and to keep certain information confidential, as well as pursuant to 143-318.11A3 uh, in order to 
confer with the town attorney regarding matters protected by the attorney client privilege and preserve that privilege, including the town uh, versus Cherry Inc. Uh, beach nourishment easement condemnation litigation. Thank you. I have a motion. Second. Or sec I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The board will be in closed session. Mr. Lighty, would you report? And then I believe there's going to need to be a motion. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. So the, um, the board uh, did take uh, action to approve closed session minutes and to keep certain ones confidential, but to approve the opening of others uh, and did consult with the town attorney regarding matters within the attorney client privilege, but no other actions were taken. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, board members, does anyone wish to, to make a motion? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we uh, have a moratorium on development in C2 for a period not to exceed 150 days. So Would that be between? Between Danube Street and Hollowell Street, uh, which is consistent with the and then we land would, use plan. We would schedule the public hearing for the mid-month meeting. On October 19th. Prepare the advertisement for that. Yeah, initiate the process to adopt one, the moratorium. Okay. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, for yes. a moment. In light of the past few months, um, the things we've heard, as well as taking a look at our land use plan, I think it would be appropriate. Um, we've had a lot of concerns um, in a few, more than one area, maybe that entirety of that, but um, it's already come to light back in uh, August, and I think that um, this would give us a breathing room for staff to take a look at our zoning map for the land use plan. Thank you. Any other comment? And this would affect everything except single and two family dwellings. Correct. Right. That's well, I believe that's by statute. Mm -hmm. It can only be for uh, non residential structures. Okay. Development. Non, it non. can only be for non single family, non -single duplex family residents. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, the commissioner's agenda, and I'll start with Commissioner Cahoon. Thank you. Um, we had this discussion some time ago about electric bikes, and it didn't become obvious until recently that what we all consider electric bikes have changed. Technology is growing, and the bikes are bigger, they're faster, and based on my observation, as well as a lot of comments on my end of the beach, because that's where I live, um, they're huge bikes, they go extremely fast. Um, they are almost running over people on the pedestrian path. They're 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 fast. They're not a bicycle that we think, or an electric bicycle, or electric scooter, or anything like that. They're big tires. They're big bikes. Um, cars coming out of driveways can stop and look in one look in a direction, look in another direction, and when they turn around, get ready to pull out. That electric bike is right there, even though it's way further down the street when they first took a glance at it. So they're going faster than an average bicycle. And I'm, I'm not talking about 158. I'm talking about our multi-use paths. And I think we need to address it sooner rather than later. Do um, you, you have any suggestions what you'd like to see? We have a speed limit on our bike path. And I'm not trying to set up patrols or anything else like that, but I think I'd like the police department to take a look at these electric bikes, bring us back some information so that we can be aware of what we're doing, that we can be educated and see what next steps we need to take. I don't, I don't disagree. They're being operated in a very different way than I think we sort of envisioned. I know you had expressed concern that we didn't want to get into the electric bike police kind of thing. And I, we all agreed with you as well, but, from that conversation to today, the evolution has appeared. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I think it expands to motorized vehicles, it, electric motorized vehicles. It has changed. It was one thing to see golf carts on the bike path, but now it's another to see these vehicles that are whizzing by. And you've got a lot of people with strollers and a lot of people with children walking. And I'm not sure they can stop. Mm -hmm. mm. He can't stop for the car that's backing out that doesn't see him either. Yeah. Yeah. That was brought up in our meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, then do you have any additional items? One, uh, for all the people that came and spoke about Jockey's Ridge this morning on either side, thank you very much. Um, I would like to see the park exercise more public input and involve not just their, I'm glad to see they're involving their friends, but there are a lot of people that care about the park. Um, the town has usually had really good relations with the park and good communication. I think that's gone by the wayside in the past few years, but I would like to see that re-encouraged because they have in the past submitted plans for the town to review. It'd be nice if that were to occur, but I think there just needs to be a lot more openness and community involvement in this process. That's it for me. Thank you. I'll stay on that end, Commissioner. <laughs> all right. Um, I'd also like to thank all the public comments today. Um, hear citizens is, is nice. We, we do it frequently. Sometimes we don't want to hear it, but it's always nice. And also, I don't know that um, I, anybody's given uh, town staff, Kelly, Kate, Connor, and um, Andy, and the mayor props for their presentation of COA. David. David, for their, their uh, um, cause that was a great presentation good representation of what the town's doing behind the scenes it's very good we we were we were working on a press release it's a, it probably needed to come out a few days ago but we've got something drafted that we'd like to get out and it's going to be a joint release with csi just going over what happened and what we're trying to do so thank you just similar to what the other commissioners have said thank you the people that came out today to speak, I hear their uh, concerns, and also the people that took time to uh, send emails, which were uh, read into the record. Thank you for that. Thank you. Bob. Yeah, I agree. It's good for the community to get involved. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Um, that brings us down to the uh, the mayor's agenda, and and before I forget. Um, there are three items there, but there is one other thing that I have been observing and that I would like to speak to uh, just just real briefly while, while we're in open session and speaking to the public. Um, we have an election coming up, and um, Nags Head used to be, uh, in that town hall here used to be the, the, the polling place. Um, I, 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 I and I think Commissioner Cahoon has expressed would like to see them come back to the town uh, from from the school now that now that COVID has passed, but there's a lot of discussion um, in the public um, and has been in the media about poll workers um, accusations that that somehow the process is rigged that they are not not trustworthy uh, that they can't be trusted with their elections and the, and the machinery of of elections and. I had a longtime employee, uh, Jane Brown, who used to live in the Cove. And every election, I gave her the day off, and um, I think probably a day and a half because it was set up and breakdown. And she worked the Nags Head polls. And I have a neighbor today in Nags Head, hey, Nags Head Acres um, who has been a longtime poll worker. Um, and it's gotten to the point where, you, you know, people are reluctant um, and I, I would understand that, you know, reluctance to go volunteer and work because it's a volunteer job to volunteer and go work the polls because um, uh, certain segments of the public um, just are angry and they don't think you, you can be trusted and they think somehow you're corrupting the process. And so I, I would like to say I've always trusted the polls in Dare County. I think we have quality workers there. They are our friends and our neighbors. Um, and they do, they do great work. Um, and I would like for them to know, um, that they have, uh, my support certainly for the work that they do and hopefully your support, um, as well. Here, here. Absolutely. They are.
deserve our support. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that brings us to consideration of a um, resolution uh, to support the bridge to replace the Alligator River Bridge. Uh, this has been brought up to us before. We know that a lot of these have used that bridge going back and forth to work. It's a critical link now um, and, and there for, for, for us, uh, folks on both sides of the bridge. Um, there was a resolution recently, which um, an air resolution addressed this, but there was a grant opportunity from the federal government for that bridge uh, to be replaced. And so it was timely that we would adopt a new resolution uh, and forward that to all the appropriate parties in the U.S. Department of Transportation and our uh, representatives in Washington in particular um, and encourage them to finally put the money forward for this bridge to get replaced because the conventional financing mechanism that we have is not going to get there. And so I bring this back to you. I'm not going to read this to today. It's similar to other resolutions that we have had in the past. Um, and so having seen that, um, a motion would be in order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, the Albemarle Association, I am the delegate uh, to the Albemarle Association. They have a meeting on October the 20th, uh, 2022, uh, that's over in Plymouth. And um, I will be out of town on October the 20th. And so my purpose here today was to ask uh, for a volunteer, if anyone was available, uh, to attend that meeting in my stead. It, it um, begin registration begins at 9.30 a.m. Um, I believe those meetings usually go until, yeah, sometime just after lunch. I wish I could, but I'll be in Raleigh. Okay. I'm checking my schedule. This would be a good opportunity to also trumpet the bridge, you know, the Alligator River Bridge. I'm sure that will be a topic of discussion there, certainly. If nobody else is available, I, I, I am free mayor. Okay, thank you. Day is that? October 20th. Thursday. Yep. Day after our business. Oh, gotcha. If you are willing, yes, sir. Uh, I'll be happy to, Commissioner. All that. right, then, um, then I would move then that Commissioner Brinkley be appointed uh, as my as our delegate to that uh, association meeting. You need a vote. I need a second. Yeah. Second. Um, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. All right. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate that, sir. Um. We've already dealt with the uh, closed session to consider um, minutes. Do we do we need to report? Did you report that? I did. I did okay. report. All right. Thank you. Very good. Uh, that brings us then to other business. Hearing none, and that brings us to recess to Wednesday, October the 19th at 9 a.m. for the mid-month meeting. And I will be absent. I apologize. So moved. I have a motion to recess. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. 